Yeah, I think time is up. Uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, we are starting our second session of MG16. It's called GB1, uh, Fast Radio Bursts. And today we will have seven invited uh, talks and each, uh, each speaker has 20 minutes, 17 plus three. And we will have uh, a uh, discussion session afterwards and two breaks in between. Uh, to begin with, let's welcome uh, Dr. D. Lee talking about 1,652 pulses from FRB 12.11.02. Go ahead, D. All right. Um, I uh, just confirm that you can you can see my uh, full screen. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I, um, it's my pleasure uh, and and thanks uh, being Wiki and Dunk for this opportunity to uh, report on this uh, uh, new data set. Um, so we have been doing this uh, drift scan survey uh, with FAST. And so far we have published uh, four new uh, FRBs uh, in, in this uh, circle. So they are roughly in this uh, larger DM access and fainter end, uh, which is not surprising. Um, and which the uh, congregate of the fast search co confirm that, that the previous uh, prediction of the so luminosity function of FRB can be extended down to fast detection threshold. And the absolute number uh, I think is still worth noting uh, at the moment is about 120K uh, event arriving on Earth per day. And uh, if all this event and this trend can be continued to the SKA detection threshold, that would mean uh, somewhere between 1 million to 10 million events per day. So, uh, so we'll be uh, living with uh, fast radio bursts for, uh, for the foreseeable future. And come to a topic of this talk, uh, in collaboration with the Berkeley team, uh, we have built this uh, transient uh, backend. Uh, so it utilized the ring buffer uh, and real-time detection to try to uh, catch the uh, signal and the and, and save uh, necessary data. Uh, it worked for both SETI and FRB. So when we uh, started test this uh, backend back in 2019, uh, we were lucky to catch uh, a very active uh, episode of uh, 12.11.02. So this is one of the uh, brightest burst detected on August 30th, uh, 2019. And in the subsequent uh, one month and a half, 12.11.02 uh, stay uh, active for most of the time. And uh, on certain days, uh, it goes to uh, a hyperactive mode. So as shown on the upper left uh, is the uh, arrival time of the burst and the brightness roughly scale with the detected fluence uh, overlaid on, on this background uh, image uh, from HST. So the uh, punchline is that uh, in a total of little less than 50 observing hours uh, in the time span of about 57 days, uh, they were a total of 1,652 burst. And on two days, uh, the, in the peak hour, uh, there are uh, more than uh, 117 uh, bursts. So that leaves us uh, a lot of data. And, uh, and many of them have complex structure. Uh, so this little animation is just showing that in the step of a DM value of one, which represent about uh, two thousands of the total DM, uh, the, the birth shape would change. So we uh, uh, use different method to do uh, uh, the dispersion. And it's also worth noting that 
when the detection threshold changes uh, the number of births uh, and the uh, even the arrival time will uh, shift uh, slightly. Uh, taking all this uncertainty into account, there's still a palpable trend. Somehow we lost you. We cannot hear you anymore. Is it just me or? No, no. Looks like I I, I hear you, but I don't hear him. Okay. Um. Let's see how how do I do this? Probably. <laughs> Um, maybe we should just give him a, a moment to try and reconnect. I'm not sure there's much we can do. Um, uh, hi, Bing. Uh, how about hi. now? Yeah, so we can. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah, apologize for the un unstable connection. Uh, so I, I hope that, uh, so I, I will go faster. Um, is the, uh, can the slide be, be seen now? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a, uh, a null hypothesis test. So we're just assuming the number of detections and, uh, but with the, uh, uh, with the same uh, DM value and using the uncertainty range uh, in each uh, data set. And the increasing trend has a significance of roughly uh, 2.3 sigma. So it's, uh, it's there, but, uh, but it's certainly uh, require further test. So this is the uh, birth rate per hour. Uh, and as you're seeing through each day, so you can see that roughly three orders of magnitude uh, energy range uh, is persistent. And there's the distribution and also the cumulative distribution in blue curve. So if we put all the data uh, uh, together, the x-axis uh, is the Julian date. Uh, the vertical axis is the energy. Uh, you can see it's, uh, it certainly has this uh, low energy floor and on certain days, uh, it has this high energy component. Uh, the, so we, we use standard software, uh, both Hamdo and Presto, that each has its own sort of behavior. And just to test the completeness of that, uh, we inject simulated pulses. So you can see the, the, the red arrow point to the pulses uh, that uh, were eventually detected and the blue one uh, were missed. So those tend to be the narrower and weaker ones. And the uh, eventual behavior of the detection experiment uh, roughly conform to the expectation. So the fluence uh, limit scale with uh, uh, the square root of the width. And uh, we can define a practical completeness threshold uh, at certain energy of fluence uh, uh, if we detect more than 90% uh, of the injected pulse. Uh, so in that case, uh, you can see here, uh, indicate the 90% uh, completeness uh, in, in terms of fluence and below which uh, we really start to lose uh, constraint on, on its number. Uh, if, say for example, if the burst energy uh, is below a couple of times 10 to the 37. Uh, uh, in in uh, principle, there could be infinite number of uh, uh, much weaker pulses that were missed. If we add those uh, a percentage of simulated but undetected pulse back, uh, the the red curve uh, is the uh, sort of uh, refurbished uh, pulse set. Uh, it uh, it will make the 
distribution at lower energy part wider, uh, but it shouldn't uh, uh, budge the uh, peak uh, rate uh, uh, energy. Uh, so uh, we still consider it uh, relatively uh, robust. All right, uh, so if we look at the birth rate energy distribution, uh, it has been uh, studied by uh, Casey and uh, Gordagy and Mary Cruz's uh, with different uh, data set. And the, uh, a power law of different uh, uh, slope uh, has been assumed. And if we look at the fast data set, at high energy end, it can still be uh, reasonably described as a power law, but if you look at the full range, uh, it certainly requires something uh, more complex. And uh, we found that a bimodal distribution that involve on the low energy end, a log normal function, and at high energy end, a Lorentzian function uh, would do a decent job. So a log normal function uh, ha has been commonly used to describe a stochastic process. And a Lorentzian function is basically a steepening power law with an asymptotic uh, index value of two. And it could represent uh, uh, two stochastic, stochastic processes uh, that has a uh, coincidental uh, uh, correlation, but uh, uh, we, we, we didn't go uh, much uh, beyond that in terms of physical interpretation. So this is just uh, showing uh, what the uh, Lorentzian function uh, look like. And the, uh, the actual data has a slightly less uh, steep asymptotic slope, uh, but it's, uh, it's 1.83. Uh, but it's uh, within the uncertainty and the sampling of the data, uh, they are roughly consistent with each other. Let's see. And because the, oh, the, the number of bursts uh, is, is quite uh, substantial, but they are all concentrated within a time span of a month and a half. So it really doesn't uh, provide too, too many additional constraints to the long-term periodicity that has been uh, proposed, uh, which, uh, which is at about 157 days. Uh, so the fast rate uh, results so far are roughly con consistent. We do detect uh, the burst in the active window, but in the recent predicted active uh, window, they have been no detections. Uh, so it changes the duty cycle to be slightly larger, uh, but, uh, but that's not the, the major impact of this data set. And we can look at the time domain behavior uh, by looking at the waiting time. And uh, this data set has two characteristic peak. So the longer peak center around 70 seconds. Uh, so that consistent with the underlying uh, arrival time being stochastic and it's uh, shaped by the, uh, by the sampling. Uh, however, the, 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 the short time scale clustering around 3.5 uh, millisecond, uh, it's significant. Uh, so it could be uh, something uh, characteristic of its underlying uh, physical processes. So we have used uh, three different methods to try to find the periodicity. And I think uh, we, in practice, uh, we basically rule out uh, any periodicity or quasi-periodicity between one millisecond and uh, 1,000 second. Uh, this is just a little animation showing the total number of bursts uh, known uh, from the year of the data and the the number of bursts known from uh, FRB 12, 11, 02. So it started with uh, the Lorimer burst and also the uh, discovery paper by Laura Spittler and, and uh, the recent uh, CHIME uh, catalog. And that's where the numbers uh, stand now. Uh, so the 12, 11, 02, I think will, will be a treasure trove for uh, bursts uh, for the for foreseeable future. So, so here is a, a, a rough uh, summary. Uh, so 
in drift scan, FAST has discovered six new FRBs uh, that's consistent with uh, the previous expected detection rate, just extended to a uh, lower uh, fluence threshold. And uh, the in this particular episode, the uh, burst rate of 121102 has a characteristic uh, peak energy at uh, about five times 10 to 37 erg. And in the 47 active days, uh, the total energy of this uh, more than 1600 burst add up to about 1% of the total available energy from a single magnetar, uh, assuming uh, some reasonable uh, beaming factor. Uh, 121102 in this episode, uh, the burst rate uh, uh, energy distribution uh, can be adequately described by a log normal plus a Lorentzian function. Uh, no periodicity can be found between one millisecond uh, and 1,000 uh, second. And there's a significant clustering of waiting time around 3.5 millisecond. Uh, so I would uh, uh, step sort of a little bit beyond the direct observable to say that uh, it seems to us that the 121102 burst, at least from this one episode, unlikely to have originally from a single uh, compact object. Uh, if we're considering the available energy, uh, its lack of periodicity and uh, its uh, energy distribution that seem to have a stochastic nature. So uh, that's, uh, that's all of my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. Um, it's well on time and quite comprehensive. So now uh, we have time for some questions because we are a small group. I think you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask questions directly. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, did, if I understood you correctly, did you say that um, during the most recent predicted active window, FAST uh, did not detect any bursts from 12.11.02, in, I guess in spite of lots of observations? Right. Is that Correct. That's right. So, so here is a little bit complicated. But if you look at the lower panel, there are some vertical uh, lines. The the that's that's when the observation happens. Usually, it's uh, one uh, to two hours on that particular day. So the so the gray lines are uh, the observations. So they are about one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, in the last active window that has resulted in no burst. And in the previous active window, there are some detections uh, mixed with some non-detections. And then there's the most recent window. Uh, I think it needs to be updated. Uh, there's, uh, I think we have a couple of uh, nights uh, that has no detections. So it, it uh, so the source uh, has so fast has detect no bursts from 12 11 02 since uh, last August. Is that um, are, are we now quite do you think it's we should be questioning the 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 claimed periodicity because of that or is the exposure within the active window insufficient to rule it out? Right. Um, so even during that very active episode, we can see the the burst rate uh, uh, certainly vary uh, in in the quite a substantial range. So uh, one um, possibility is that I think this source may be turning off, uh, or this this whole rate is dropping. So if if the if those uh, increasing dm and decreasing rm and all those are true uh, we we may be seeing this uh some sort of explosive event that's uh, that's evolving well, do you want to ask a question oh 
Oh yeah, I was asking like, but for the previous uh, observation with detections, is there any chance? Because that already spent lots of years and already have the DMRM changes. Do you notice any evolution with that? Oh, uh, so, so that's uh, another aspect of the work that uh, I didn't mention since uh, since it's, it's still being analyzed is that the RM measurement of 121102 all happen at frequency band higher than L band. So the even though we have more than a thousand uh, bursts with distant signal to noise ratio, we, we cannot detect the RM. And um, so it's either very large or it's just not there. Uh, but I think we have rule out it's being very, very large uh, given the number of channels and the smearing that we have considered. It, it really have to be uh, substantially more than 100,000 RM uh, in order for us to be uh, totally smeared out. Um, I had two quick questions. Great talk, Dee. Um, how statistically significant is the non-detection in the last observing cycle? Um, it's hard to say. Um, so if the, if the energy floor uh, start to drop for this source, then it, it, it go into the uh, the, the marginal, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the, the, the sensitivity of fast uh, uh, has not changed. And, and we are looking at a fast transient uh, signal. So it, it happened only a few thousands of a second. Mm. Uh, so so we, we were not affected by sort of the, say, the gain drift or, the, or some system instability. Right. Uh, so, so I think is we just didn't see it during that particular hour. Uh, we, since the source is not active, we, we spend about one to two hours per month uh, on, right. on the source. Okay. Um, so the other question I uh, had was, so is it true that your detections are in the later half of the activity phase? Uh, they are, they are. Uh, so the, the plot that you have right now, so the blue circle. So just by eye, it looks like these are 1.4 gigahertz detections, but they're in the later half of the gray region. Um, so the the light gray region. So you can see those. Uh, um, so on the lower panel, I think it's sort of in the middle. So those red squares are, are that that burst uh, and the 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 sort of light gray zoom are the active uh, are the predicted uh, active window uh, based on that uh, uh, 156 days long period and a 50 percent uh, active duty cycle right okay thank you all right, thanks, Dee. We have to move on. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Yuan Pei Yang. The title is Fast Radio Burst and Their High Energy Counterpart from Many Tar Magnet Sphere. Okay. Uh, hi, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our recent work about a magnetar model of a fast video burst. Uh, today, my topic is the fast video burst and their high energy counterpart from magnetar magnetic field. Uh, my collaborate is Bing. Okay. Uh, last year, a galaxy fast video burst was detected to be associated with an X-ray burst from galaxy magnetar. Such an event suggests that at least some FRB originated from magnetar in active phase. During the active phase of this magnetar on April 28 last year, over 200 X-ray bursts were detected and a burst storm appeared 14 hours before this FRB. 
Besides X-ray burst, the source also show a persistent X-ray remission with a double peak pulse profile, and the observed period is consistent with the magnetar rotation. It is interesting that the arrival time of this FRB land in the phase of with the peak of a pulse profile. The flux and the temperature of the X-ray persistent emission decrease rapidly in the earlier stage of the outburst, but the size of the emitting area remained unchanged. The high energy emission from magnetar has been suggested to be triggered by magnetar activity, magnetosphere magnetos activity. For fast radio burst, models for the generation of a coherent radio emission can be divided into two broad classes based on the distance from the neutron star where they operate. The first class consists of far-away models where the relativistic ejecta from a neutron star displaces its energy at a large dis distance by interacting with the ambient medium. And the FRB is generated by, the, by a major process. The second class includes the closing models, which describe the coherent pr process occurs within the magnetosphere of a neutron star. Both of them have energy supply from um, magnetic energy. The main difference is the region of uh, energy dissipation. The magnetic energy inside the magnetosphere is given by the second formula, and uh, it is enough to power a uh, uh, faster video burst. For for repeating FRB source, one should address how many video bursts could be produced within the energy budget of a magnetar. The first repeating source, FRB121102, has been bursting over eight years so far, and uh, its, its event rate can be described by a power law distribution. Its active leaf significantly exceeds known galaxy magnetar. Based on the event rate, the total released energy during 10,000 years is about 10 to 47 uh, arcs. The burst energy is uh, sustainable by a uh, magnetar for a duration of a few years, even if the efficiency is uh, higher than that of the galaxy FRB. The active time is much shorter than the typical age of a uh, magnetar, which suggests that high, e high event rate only lasts for a short period compared with the typical uh, lifetime of a uh, magnetar. So active F FRB repeaters in the universe may originate from very young magnetar with a strong field. Uh, we consider that FRB are triggered by cross fracturing of a magnetar during its active phase, because the outer crust has a much lower density than that in, than that in the inner crust. More frequent star quake can occur in this region. During the evolution of a magnetic field, once the shear stress reach a critical value, the crust will crack, leading to star quakes. At the outer crust, the critical bending angle of a magnetic field is about 10 to minus 3 radian. So once the field lines slightly bend, the outer crust will fracture. So star quake rate in the outer crust uh, depend on the magnetic field evolution, which can be generally given by the third equation. The evaction and the ohmic term could be negative because the plasma is almost at rest and the condu conductivity is very large. So whole drift dominates the magnetic field evolution in short term. All the whole drift is non-dissipative. It can change the magnetic field configure. The typical whole time scale in outcrust is about a few years. Because the critical bending angle of the magnetic field is small, the typical time scale of outcrust fracturing would be much shorter than the whole drift time scale. So the event rate could be about a few bursts per day. And the burst rate significantly depend on the magnetic field strength of a neutron star. In long term, uh, the magnetic field in crust would decay by ohmic dissipation. Two mechanisms dominate this process. First, the nonlinear horn term gives rise to turbulence cascade to smaller scale. Second, the ohmic dissipation rate is enhanced by a whole cascade. The typical time scale for the magnetic field decay is about a few hundred years depending on the initial field strength. When the magnetar edge is smaller than the decay time scale, the burst rate is constant. Once the edge exceeds the decay time scale, the burst rate would decrease significantly. 
So active repeating FRB are proposed to originate from very young magnetar with stronger magnetic field. Uh, because the number of young magnetar in the universe is relatively small, uh, we expect that the active repeating FRB are rarer than one of uh, FRBs. Such a result may also offer an offer, uh, interpret interpretation uh, to the periodic activity of FRB 1A0916, because the internal strong magnetic field of young magnetar can deform the star, leading to possible free precession with a long period. The corresponding discussion could be seen in the following Dom's report. Uh, on the other hand, the repeating behaviors may also depend on the line of sight if FRB emission is beamed. Because the pole region have a much stronger field, the quad fracturing may more easily occur in this region. At the pole of a multiple, multiple field, the magnetic energy is stronger, the fracturing rate uh, is larger. We call uh, the region with the large fracturing rate as the fragile region. If the fragile region swept across the line of sight as the magnetar rotates, one would detect FRB with a high repetition rate. As discussed in the above this report, uh, the burst of FRB 121102 appear to have two components in the energy distribution. According to such a picture, the two components might co correspond to two fragile regions with different magnetic field strengths. Uh, the high brightness temperature of uh, uh, FRB implies that his radiation mechanism must be coherent because FRBs have some propensity similar to radio emission of a normal pulsar. Some pulsar-like coherent radiation mechanism have been proposed. The connection between FRB and the radio pulsar are manifested by the flowing fact. Uh, first, FRB and the radio pulsars are the most coherent source in all kinds of uh, astrophysics phenomena. In addition to normal radio pulse, some pulsars show giant pulse with the, bright with the brightness temperature compared to FRBs. Uh, although the luminosity of a giant pulse is uh, much smaller than the, that of a FRB. Uh, second, both the periodic uh, radio pulse and the uh, FRB 2048 was, was emitted from galaxy magnetar. And uh, there have been some bright uh, radio bursts with the flux between normal radio pulse and uh, uh, this uh, galaxy FRB. Uh, in this work, we consider FRB is generated by coherent plasma radiation in the magnetar magnetosphere. When the crust crack, a magnetic field uh, disturbance is produced by foot point motion at the surface of a neutron star. The often we packet travel along the field line and his, uh, his amplitude decreases with distance. Because the plasma density decreases with the radius, a strong parallel electron field is in induced by often wave at a, a critical radius where the uh, charge, starv charge starvation occurs. At the charge star region, the strong electron field trigger pair cascade, and the electron pair would accelerate and emit gamma ray photo. Then the cascade process is interrupted when the uh, fresh pair uh, is able to screen the accelerating electron field. This process uh, could be repeated, uh, driving a large amplitude electron static wave, as proposed in pulsar picture. And the, uh, the amplitude of the electron static wave is about 10% of the initial accel accelerating electron field. Uh, recently, uh, Pilipov 2020 performed a peak simulation and uh, uh, claimed that coherent electromagnetic radiation can be directly generated in non stationary pair plasma discharges. The mechanism was applied to interpret uh, uh, pulsar radio emission. As shown in the second picture, we consider the discharge occurs in the background magnetic field along X axis. Particle move along the field line and the uh, electron current is Gx. The magnetic field is assumed to be uniform in the Z direction. According to Maxwell's equation, Z more wave cannot be directly emitted in the discharging process. 
because his field does not couple with the plasma. For an OMO wave, the electromagnetic wave can be excited when the system is non-uniform in the y direction. So the non-uniform discharge in the y direction is a necessary condition to generate coherent electromagnetic wave, which corresponds to non-uniform pair, pair creation across the uh, magnetic field line. Uh, we, define, we define the inclination angle between the normal direction of uh, plasma injection front and the background magnet field. Then the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave is given by the second to the to last equation, which depends on the inclination angle and the, the amplitude of the electron static wave. Compare this result with the FRP amplitude that is calculated with, by the observed, observed flux. We find that the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave is about 1% of the initial initial accelerating field, which is also consists with the simulation result. Within this picture, magneta with a strong field tend to generate FRB with a larger burst energy. Uh, next, uh, we make a brief discussion about the propensity of FRB associated X-ray burst. The associated X-ray burst appear to have, to have, have some different propensity from the normal X-ray burst including sharp peak complement and uh, hard energy cutoff. Under strong magnetic field of a magneta, for e more photo, the stronger the magnetic field, the more transparent the trapped fiber. When a trapped fiber transforms, the e more X-ray photon would, escape, would es escape from the bottom of a trapped fiber near the magneta surface and uh, enter a region between two adjacent trapped fiber and uh, further be resultantly scattered by the elect ele uh, relativistic electron in per region. The radiative force of X-ray emission would change the electron momentum distribution in short term. In the equilibrium states, the balance velocity depends on the injecting uh, photo direction re relate to the field line. Because the Lorentz factor of the electron is about a few, the cutoff energy of X-ray emission would be increased by several times compared with those without resonance scattering, uh, which might explain the high energy cutoff of the associated X-ray burst. Another important observation capacity of the associated X-ray burst is that his cu uh, cutoff, uh, uh, his light curve show sharp complement aligned with the galaxy FRB. We propose that the Sharpie complement is from the region between two adjacent trap fiber. When the mode X-ray photo enters the region between two adjacent trap fiber, they will be confirmed in a beam angle due to the large optical depth at the top region of the tra trapped fiber around it. So the radiation from this region would be confirmed in a narrow beam, especially for multiple view and uh, near the magnetar surface. A large flux is emitted in this region and the radiation beam is confirmed by the sharp fiber leading to sharp complement in his light curve. Uh, at last, uh, in addition to X-ray burst, this galaxy magnet also shows a persistent X-ray emission with a double peak pulse profile during his active phase. The arrival time of FRB2048 light in Based with the brightest peak of the pulse profile. The black body temperature of X-ray persistent emission decreased rapidly in the earliest stage of the outburst, but the size of the emitting area remains the same with the radius of a few uh, kilometers. We propose that the X-ray persistent emission is from a hot spot uh, on the magnetar surface and uh, calculate its temperature evolution. The, the internal energy is mainly stored by iron in the outer crust, and uh, the stored energy is about 10 to 30 X arc, which is about 1% of the associated X-ray uh, burst. Based on the temperature evolution equation, the typical cooling time is about one day, uh, which is consistent uh, with the observation. Uh, at last, uh, I make a summary. Uh, we propose that FRB are triggered by quartz fracturing of uh, magneta with the first event rate depending on the magnetic field strength in, in the crust. 
The cross fracturing pr produced often with forming a charge starved region in the magnetosphere and uh, leading to non stationary plasma discharges. Uh, FRB is produced by coherent plasma emission due to uh, non uniform pair production across the magnetic field line. The sharp peak component of X ray burst associated, associated with the FRB 2048 is from a region between two adjacent travel ball. And the heat spectrum is, with a high cut of energy is attributed to resonant competence scattering. The persistent X ray emission is from a hot spot heated by the magnet field activity, and the heat temperature evolution is determined by magnetar surface cooling. Uh, with this picture, magnetar with a stronger field uh, tend to produce brighter and more frequent uh, repeated burst. Uh, my report is over. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Yuan Pei. Uh, questions? My question. Uh, hi. Uh, Yang Pei, uh, recently there was a paper by Bilobarodov group about decay of LVN wave in the charge starvation region. Uh, they claim that uh, the LVN wave just decays smoothly without uh, something drastically. Yeah, uh, yes, as the, your pitch, uh, is your pitch compatible with, with there or please comment? Because you, you, you essentially uh, assume that uh, when Alvin wave enters uh, charge starvation region, it produces plenty of pairs and, and so on. Uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, in this work, uh, our uh, concurrent. Uh, coherent radiation region is at a charge star region. Uh, mm -hmm. th this is based on a uh, simulation work of uh, Pilipov 2020. I think uh, uh, he uses uh, you right. the question regarding the alpha wave, where the alpha wave can produce the uh, uh, charge star uh, region. Uh, uh, can I comment on this? Uh, so the first one is the, I think the, uh, uh, their current simulation uh, didn't run long enough. Uh, I understand that the, for just one propagation wavelength, it, there's no charge star, uh, starving yet. Uh, we, we don't know whether when the simulation run long enough, uh, something will appear. But uh, regardless of that, I think in uh, Yuanpei's scenario, we just need a... Um, um, charge stop the region. Either it is from the uh, uh, alpha wave or uh, in general, for example, something like a pulsar like uh, 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 slot gap type of the XR region. In any case, as long as we have a E parallel, then uh, this mechanism can, can start. It's different from Kumar et al. We need the uh, coherent curvature radiation by bunches. Th this one is the plasma wave. Thank you. So, so Bing, am I getting it right? You need a low twist region? <laughs> oh, right. Can you comment on low twist region more? Oh, you mean the E parallel? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. commenting, yes. E, this other region would be, have to be a low twist region. E, exactly, yes. Yep. So, yep. so you will talk about that in your talk. Yes, great. Other questions to Yanpei? Okay, if not, let's thank Yanpei again. And we move on to Kenzie. Kenzie Nemo, bus radio burst with VLBI. Can, you... um, can, I, can I share my screen? Yeah, you need okay, to share. Uh, okay. Okay, I have a stop here. Thank you. Okay. You can see my slides? Yes. Yeah. And you can see my cursor as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kenzie Nemo. I'm a, a third year PhD student at the University of Amsterdam and Astron in the Netherlands. Um, 
And yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I'm excited to tell you how we're studying fast radio bursts using high resolution instruments. Um, yeah, so I think everyone on the call knows what fast radio bursts are, but very quickly, uh, FRBs are extremely bright, short duration, coherent radio flashes that come from extra galactic distances. Um, to put it into context, we have the transient phase space diagram here, which is luminosity on the y-axis and duration on the x-axis. Um, the pulsars and rotating radio transients are shown in pink, with uh, crab giant pulses shown in orange. And some crab giant pulses are seen to exhibit, exhibit nanosecond duration shots of emission, which are uh, called nano shots, shown in yellow. And then the FRBs are all the way up here. Um, so they're about the same duration as pulsars, but with uh, many orders of magnitude higher luminosity. Um, we've seen some FRBs that repeat, uh, like, uh, like what Dee was showing a few talks ago, um, but the vast majority seem to be one-off uh, bursts. And the, uh, the main kind of open questions that, that are, that's driving my research is, um, what are fast radio bursts? What kind of objects produce fast radio bursts? What's the emission physics behind the FRBs? And um, are there multiple populations? Are repeaters and non-repeaters uh, the same type of object in emission physics or are they uh, completely different things? Um, so how can we use very long baseline interferometry to uh, probe these questions about fast radio bursts? Um, so this is the, the Chime telescope. Uh, on Monday, we had a, a few talks about um, some, some work within the CHIME FRB collaboration. Um, we collaborate with CHIME such that when they uh, discover a repeating fast radio burst, we follow up with the European VLBI network. Um, the EVN is a global network of radio telescopes that use very long baseline interferometry to make really high spatial resolution images of the radio sky. We also have an ongoing project called PRECISE. Precise, um, the idea here is to use an ad hoc EVN array using dishes that at a given moment are not being used by the EVN. Um, and the advantage of precise is that we usually get a lot more on sky time than we do with, with regular EVN, but it comes at the cost of the number of antennas usually per observation. Um, in both of these, the, the idea here, what we want to do is we want to precisely localize FRBs to study their host galaxy, to figure out where they are in their host galaxies, and also to probe really the, the immediate environment of the fast radio burst. Um, and all of these things can give us clues about the progenitor. We also record baseband data with uh, the individual telescopes. And with that, we can study the burst themselves in really high detail. So we can uh, study their full polar imagery um, and we can study the burst at very high time and high frequency resolutions. Um, and these can give us clues about the emission physics. And then finally, uh, because with Precise, we have a lot of on sky time, we can perform high cadence monitoring. So we can um, uh, target interesting sources and search for really rare events uh, from those sources. And for, for my talk just now, I'm gonna talk about the first two uh, topics here. And for high cadence monitoring, if you're interested, feel free to send me an email or a message uh, afterwards and we can talk about it. Okay, so high precision localization. Um, there are interferometers uh, like ASCAP and, and the VLA and the DSA. Um, they are localizing one-off FRBs to 100 milli arc second to few arc second precision. Um, here are some examples in the literature of, of uh, the images are the host galaxy and then you have the circles or the ellipses showing the, the FRB position. And this precision is good enough to identify uh, the host galaxies for, for most FRBs. Um, but if you really want to study the immediate environment of the FRB, you need to go to higher resolution. So you need milli arc second or 10 milli arc second precision in most cases. So here um, is a VLA, uh, a VLA radio map at the position of FRB 12.11.02. And then on this side is a five millisecond VLA snapshot at the time of a burst from this, uh, this repeating FRB. Um, so this uh, FRB, just in case anyone's not aware, this is the source that, that D. Lee was talking about. This is the very first repeating FRB. Um, so with, with the VLA, they were able to, to pinpoint where this burst is coming from. So without, within about 100 milli arc second precision. 
Um, and highlighted by the box is a radio source in the continuum map that uh, looks to be at the same position as the burst. But with the EVN, we can really zoom in on this source. Uh, so this is a five gigahertz EVN image um, of the radio source uh, from the previous slide. The gray crosses and the red cross represent four bursts that were detected from this repeater during this EVN campaign. Um, and the black is the, weight, the signal to noise weighted average position of the bursts. Um, what the EVN were able to, what the, the EVN uh, was able to do is it was able to increase the resolution, uh, the precision on the, the localization from 100 milli arc seconds to 10 milli arc seconds. It was able to confirm that the radio source uh, was in fact compact on EVN spatial scales. Uh, they could constrain the size of the radio source to less than 0.7 parsecs, and they could also um, confirm that the burst position is coincident with the radio source position within the uncertainties. Uh, additionally, with this um, position, they could pinpoint where, it, where the FRB is in its host galaxy. This is a Hubble image here. Um, and you can see it's right on top of this star forming region in the host galaxy. Um, this host galaxy is interesting. So it's a, a low metallicity dwarf galaxy, um, which uh, is typical of the hosts of long gamma ray bursts and superluminous supernovae. Um, this was the very first localized FRB. Um, and then there was a, a few more localizations after of non-repeating FRBs, and they were found in comparatively massive galaxies. And so this sparked the idea that maybe repeating FRBs are these extreme magnetars that are related to superluminous supernovae and long gamma ray bursts. Um, and then non-repeaters are just something completely different. Uh, that was the thinking until um, FRB 2018-0916B. Uh, so we localized this repeating FRB using the EVN uh, to 2.3 milli arc second accuracy. Uh, over here, I show the four bursts that were detected during the, this EVN campaign. These are the EVN clean images of the bursts. Um, and in each case, these are only a few milliseconds of data that have been imaged. And panel E is a continuum map. So this is imaging the entire observation to search for any persistent radio emission. And as you can see, we didn't detect anything, uh, which is different from what we saw from the first repeater. Uh, we also studied the host galaxy. So this is uh, with Gemini North. The FRB was coming from this massive spiral galaxy, very like the Milky Way. Uh, in fact, it's about 100 times more massive and five times higher metallicity than the host of FRB 12.1102. Um, and you can see the position of the FRB here in the arm of the spiral galaxy is very near this prominent star forming feature in the galaxy. We followed up with Hubble to achieve higher resolution in the optical. The position of 180916 is shown with a green dot. You can see that it's offset from the star forming region by a few hundred parsecs. So this highlights that repeating FRBs can live in different host galaxies and local environments. And this diversity in hosts has to be accommodated in the, the progenitor models. So either multiple different objects can produce repeating fast radio bursts, or um, there's a singular FRB progenitor that can live in many different types of environments. Uh, the one commonality between this localization and the previous localization is that they both live near uh, star forming regions. So maybe that's important for the fact that it's a repeating FRB. Um, we added more complexity to the story by studying another repeater. Uh, this FRB was very recently published by the Chang team um, and is specifically interesting because it seems to be coming from the direction of M81. Now, MET1 is a really nearby galaxy at a distance of about 3.6 megaparsecs. Uh, to compare with the other two localizations I've just talked about, they're at 1 gigaparsec and 150 megaparsec. So this is very nearby. Um, within the, the error ellipse, so that's this red ellipse here from the time uh, uh, localization, the, um, the authors identified four sources that potentially could be related to the FRB. Um, but Based on the errors, they couldn't identify which, if any, the FRB is actually associated with. By using the EVN, we were able to precisely localize this FRB to a few hundred milli arc second accuracy, uh, shown by this black ellipse here. And with this precision, we were able to identify that the bursts are coming from uh, a globular cluster in M81. Now, this association with an old stellar system is really different from the previous two star forming regions. Uh, further adding diversity to this host galaxy and local environment picture. Um, in, in fact, uh, magnetars, which are a promising model um, for uh, the production of, of FRBs, as we've just heard, um, they can be created through many different channels. So they can live in many different types of environments. Here is hard to 
to imagine that this FRB is a magnetar that was created through like your normal core collapse supernova channel, but maybe this is um, a magnetar created through accretion and just collapse of the white dwarf, uh, or maybe even a compact binary merger. Um, so this is another example of why uh, high spatial resolution is really important for FRBs. Uh, so this repeater is uh, extreme, an extremely active source. It kind of went into outburst and, and everyone pointed their telescopes at it. And I think everyone detected it. Um, so much so, yeah, there was uh, uh, many interferometers that localized the source within a few days to weeks of each other. And they're all shown on this, this plot here with the EVN dirty image of 13 bursts combined uh, shown in the background. The synthesized beam is shown in the bottom corner just to highlight the difference in precision between these instruments. Um, uh, both the VLA and the UGMRT detected radio, a radio source, a persistent radio source um, at, the, at the same position as the bursts. Um, but with the EVM, we could uh, see that in fact, there's no compact radio emission there or nearby um, pointing towards the, um, the VLA and UGMRT, uh, UGMRT detections being uh, uh, from star formation in the galaxy. A paper on this work and also a paper on another repeating FRB that the precise team have localized is in preparation at the moment. Uh, so it means that we have actually five VLBI localized repeating FRBs. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk about the burst properties um, and specifically studying them at very high time resolution. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning that uh, there are repeating and non-repeating FRBs, and it's uh, not clear if they're coming from physically different objects in emission physics or if they're all the same thing. Uh, we are, however, starting to see kind of characteristic repeating FRB qualities in the burst properties. Um, so for this FRB, which is the, the FRB in the spiral galaxy, we see the bursts are narrowband. And in fact, uh, very recently, um, uh, as uh, Pragya showed on, on Monday in, in Monday session, the Chime FRB catalog, um, there was a paper by Plunis et al showing that for this large sample of bursts, um, the repeaters are in general more narrowband than non-repeaters. Uh, we also see the sad trombone effect, which is the drift down in frequency as a function of time. Um, the polarization properties are also interesting. So uh, we see 100% linear polarization, that's the red, and blue is 0% circular polarization. And then we also have a constant polarization angle during the burst and also between bursts. Uh, and these properties are also seen for the first repeating FRB 1202. I'm gonna handpick this burst here uh, and zoom in in time. So this is the burst at 64 microsecond resolution. If we go to 16 microsecond and then one microsecond resolution with some zoom in panels, you can see that there's burst structure down to three to four microseconds in this burst. Um, so this is constraining for the size of the emission region. It tells us that it's about a kilometer uh, if we ignore any relativistic effects. And in fact, not all of the bursts resolve down to these microsecond structures. We see a range of different time scales with a dynamic range of about 500. Um, additionally, the polarization angle varies on these really short time scales. Um, maybe these are also characteristic of repeating FRBs. Um, but these observations I've just talked about, we were actually limited by Milky Way uh, interstellar medium scattering uh, due to the low galactic latitude. But you can see this other repeater, which is the globular cluster repeater, uh, is at much higher galactic latitude. And so we uh, have a better, we can have a better constraint on the shortest temporal features in this FRB. So these are the four bursts that we use to localize this fast radio burst to the globular cluster. And as you can see, they exhibit all of these uh, same properties that we've seen in the other two repeating FRBs. Um, yeah, the, the time resolution here is eight microseconds. So we're already at very, very high time resolution. You can see that there are small variations in the polarization angle um, at this resolution. Then I'm gonna take out burst B3 here and zoom in in time. So we're going from eight microseconds to one microsecond in green uh, to 30 nanoseconds in black. Uh, with some zoom in panels below. And we see that there's actually burst structure down to about 60 nanoseconds um, in this burst. Uh, again, we looked at all of the bursts at very high time resolution and uh, they, they show a range of different time scales with a dynamic range of about a thousand. And actually this uh, kind of forest of, of shots that you can see here really uh, resembles what's been seen before from the crab pulsar. So this is a, a crab giant pulse plotted at one nanosecond resolution with a zoom in below. Um, and you can see the same kind of uh, forest structure. 
Okay, so I'm going to bring back this plot from the beginning of my talk, but now I'm going to populate it with um, the, the time scales that I've just talked about from, from these other repeaters. So you can see uh, this globular cluster repeater is all of the black stars here is right in this gap in, in the parameter space. Um, it doesn't really fit in any of the populations that were already there. Um, I, I've shown you that it exhibits the kind of characteristic repeating FRB qualities that um, we're starting to see in some repeaters. Um, so it has this connection to the extragalactic FRB population. Um, it has very short time scale structure uh, and this forest of shots that we see um, in the crab pulsar and also these really uh, short time scales that the brightness temperature is about the same as that of the brightest nano shots where these gray lines are constant brightness temperature. Uh, we also see a range of time scales again seen in the in crab giant pulses. And then finally, the wider components actually have a luminosity one or two orders of magnitude weaker than the really bright FRB-like event from the galactic magnetar SDR 1935. Uh, so we're really starting to see that this source is bridging the gap between extragalactic FRBs, uh, young galactic pulsars, and galactic magnetars. Um, OK, so my conclusions are uh, we're using very high spatial resolution to pinpoint exactly where FRB is coming from. We're seeing that they're living; these repeating FRBs are living in really diverse environments, um, and that has to be accommodated for in the progenitor models. Um, by studying them at very high time resolution, we're um, drawing uh, um, observational parallels between extragalactic FRBs, uh, galactic pulsars, and magnetars, um, and it could suggest that they have a, a common magnetically powered emission mechanism. And then uh, for the future of uh, VLBI for FRBs, um, the Chang telescope that I mentioned, they, they're building outrigger stations, which we heard about on Monday from Jane. Um, and they'll be able to localize lots of FRBs uh, with high enough precision to, to even study the host galaxy, but maybe even study the local environment in some cases. Um, but I will argue that for really nearby FRBs, we'll, we'll want to localize them to milliarc second or tens of milliarc second precision to really um, make the use of, of optical follow-up um, of these sources. And then in terms of the high time resolution uh, um, stuff that I mentioned, there is likely a population of these ultra-fast radio bursts in the nanosecond to a few microsecond time scales uh, that current FRB surveys are, are just not sensitive to. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Kenzie. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I have a brief comment. Uh, so for the uh, globular cluster uh, FRB, besides the several possibilities you mentioned, including the double neutron star merger, post-merger magnetar radiation, another pos possibility is the pre-merger. So before, say, decades to centuries before the merger, the two neutron stars are already uh, interacting quite strongly, and something might happen. Uh, especially this one in particular, it's not that energetic. So it is possible yeah. that uh, just uh, the pre-merger magnetic ray interaction might produce repeating FRB like this one. And it should be a uh, very good test uh, in the future by LISA because it is so nearby. If it is such kind of system, it could detect it in the gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions to Kenzie? Hi, Kenzie. I posted this in the chat. Um, great talk. But uh, I was really curious about how exactly you do your filter bank inversion. And I realize it's like kind of a technical question. But um, at least when we, we we've tried similar things and uh, we've always you know achieved mixed results because when you like flag RFI, then you kind of change frequency responses. And it uh, sounds like a really difficult problem to solve. And I was wondering how you did it. Yeah, um, so we, we had a similar problem. Eventually, we got to the point where uh, we just read out the raw data, um, essentially. So we have subbands, there are 16 megahertz subbands, so we can get to 30 nanoseconds uh, sampling. And we essentially just, we don't do any kind of um, channelization or, or Fourier transform. We, we just read out um, the data into filter bank format. Because before when we, when we did the, um, yeah, we, we did the channelization, we could only get to 60 nanosecond resolution. Um, but, but sorry, what, what was your, your specific, what's your specific problem that you're trying to solve in terms of? Um, typically when we try to, uh, you know, invert one of these subbands or something, you know, you see there's RFI in 
channels within the subband, and then you zap the RFI, and then you can't really invert anymore. Oh, I see. Okay. I don't know if you wanted um, to send more problems. I realize this is quite technical, so other people with uh, maybe higher level questions should go first, so we can also talk offline if that's. If that's yeah, of course. Be, well, I think my, my answer quickly is that we don't uh, really have strong RFI at the time of the burst in these bursts, so we don't do any flagging for the really high time resolution um, uh, work. Uh, and in the lower resolution uh, work, we have some flagging, but when we're doing the high resolution, because we're doing each subband uh, itself, but there's there's techniques. Um, I'm forgetting the name. I, I can I can figure it out. But there's a technique where you can kind of go between time and frequency um, uh, space, and you can kind of flag RFI and do your coherent dispersion and go back and forth without um, yeah messing messing up. If that makes sense. Uh, I have the name of it somewhere so I can send you it, but I mean, it, I'm sure it would be a huge rabbit hole to go down, but I think there's there's a technique where you can jump between your foot, your Fourier transform space uh, without um, having the problems that you're describing. Oh, I, see. Uh, I, I think it's used in like quantum physics, um, <laughs> but you can you can apply it to, to uh, time domain physics. Astronomy. Okay. Very cool. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thanks, Kenzie. Uh, so we are uh, running a little bit late. Let's just take a, a brief break. We will still resume around the same at the same time we planned at forty.
All right, uh, let's try to start on time. Uh, next speaker is Paul Shul, High Energy Observations of Fast Radio Bursts. Paul, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Ming, and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Oops, too bad, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm Paul Schultz from the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto. I'm a member of CHIME, although this talk is more, you know, my thoughts on high energy observations than a CHIME results talk. But uh, uh, I put on the title slide here a few sources, uh, pictures to motivate uh, why high energy. So, the duration and energetics of FRBs point to a coherent me mechanism from a compact emission reason, and it's pointing us towards things like neutron stars or uh, uh, you know, matter around black holes. Uh, and so uh, those, uh, those types of sources are quite prolific in the high energy. And so uh, that's why we are interested in uh, the X-ray and gamma ray observations of fast radio bursts. Um, so when we're doing high energy observations, what are we looking for? What are the counterparts we're um, shooting to detect? So we look at a multiple time scales. So we look at the time of fast radio bursts for prompt counterparts um, from millisecond time scales up to um, longer time scales. Of course, it depends on the time resolution of your detector. An example here is a couple hundred millisecond long uh, X-ray bursts from a, well, a source I'll come to later in my talk. <laughs> uh, also, we look at times uh, away from the fast radio bursts, for example, for a delayed counterpart like an afterglow, uh, pictured here as a gamma ray burst afterglow. Um, and then we also look on much you know, longer time scales, usually the time scale of our observation itself, uh, you know, many hours long um, for a persistent source. Uh, and that persistent source at the location of the FRB could either be, if we detected something, uh, the source itself um, of the uh, FRB, or it could be something related like uh, AGN in the host galaxy. Um, but uh, so how do we detect these counterparts? So there's uh, two uh, things we can do. We can look at the uh, data from all sky monitors uh, at the time and around the time that we detect FRBs for counterparts. We can also look uh, at just any time from the, that sky position for um, uh, emission, uh, high energy emission from all sky monitors like SWIFTBAT and Fermi GBM. So this is, uh, these are shallow, but uh, you're able to get uh, a lot you know, you get grasp on a lot of uh, FRB sources because these uh, all sky monitors have huge field of view. And it's also the only way to get uh, prompt counterparts uh, at the time of FRBs from one of FRBs because in the targeted, uh, using a targeted telescope, you can't uh, slew back in time, unfortunately. Um, so uh, we also point telescopes, uh, at uh, the positions of FRBs. And th this gives you more sensitivity to place deeper limits than you could with the all sky monitors. Um, the narrow fields of view of these telescopes means that you can only target sources that are well localized. Repeaters make great targets for this because you know that the source is capable of repeating, uh, of, of uh, emitting a radio burst again during your X-ray observation, allowing you to place limits at the time of an FRB uh, if it occurs during your high energy observation. And you can, the uh, a strategy that's been used, especially for FRB 2018-09-16 is uh, targeting at the time of uh, known activity. So it has a 16 day periodicity, of course. And so many people have targeted near the peak of its uh, 16 day periodicity. Uh, but you can also use this to probe for persistent uh, and uh, afterglows. You don't just have to look at the time of FRBs. Uh, another interesting um, strategy, which I kind of consider a hybrid between uh, 
targeted and uh, and uh, a blind survey is uh, called Guano. It's a dump of the Swift bat ring buffer, uh, if you get the pun. Um, and uh, it, so it takes uh, triggers from external telescopes from Swift uh, and uh, including from FRBs uh, and dumps that ring buffer allowing access to the raw event data um, which you wouldn't normally get uh, uh, from a from a target that wasn't triggered uh, by it automatically detected on board Swift. Um, so this so this allows you to get the same so same event data that you would get for Swift GRBs for non-Swift targets. Um, it's also you, uh, Swift is able to repoint based on um, on these triggers. And then you get uh, pointed observations using uh, the X-ray telescope and UV optical telescope. And a demonstration of this uh, was done by the Guano team, uh, where they placed limits using the event mode data, and also pretty uh, impressively uh, was on target with XRT and UVOT in 32 minutes. Um, this uh, this paper, uh, the I think the FRB was likely to be a spurious event, but it's still a um, a uh, important demonstration of the capabilities. And uh, they, Guano is now triggering and ingesting and triggering on time FRB kind of VO events. So uh, potential for uh, fruitful discoveries there. Um, while we're talking about Swift bad, it's uh, important uh, to uh, you know, say that there was a claim detection of an FRB in the past, uh, Delaney et al. detected or claimed a detection of a three sigma uh, uh, event uh, in Swift bat data. Uh, quickly thereafter, Shannon and Ravi uh, put out a paper saying that there was no evidence in the radio for a radio afterglow that you would expect from a gamma ray burst. So there was some uh, uh, skepticism there towards the result. and. More recently, uh, a reanalysis of that data has shown that this was a uh, spurious event. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a counterpart to an FRB. It depends, I guess, what you consider an FRB. Um, so uh, as we know, we've heard in past talks, uh, April 28th last year, uh, SGR 1935 went into outburst and an extremely bright event uh, was detected by it uh, in, in radio telescopes, CHIME FRB and STAIR-2. Um, in, in CHIME, it was detected 20 degrees off of where CHIME directs its uh, sensitivity at the meridian. And so we got this uh, you know, um, sawtooth pattern here, which uh, we used to localize it to the uh, location of STR 1935. Um, and this event uh, energetically was uh, quite comparable to the faintest FRBs we have. So here we have fluence against distance on this plot. And if you turn your head sideways, you see lines of constant energy. And uh, it, it's about an order of magnitude or two uh, less faint than, or less energetic than the least energetic FRB. So uh, this you know, exciting event last year showed us that galactic ring guitars can emit Burst that we would call FRBs if we, you know, if, if we detected this in an, if this had happened in Andromeda and we detected it, we would have called it an FRB. So, um, and importantly, to the talk I'm giving right now is uh, there was an X-ray counterpart. So uh, integral uh, here is an integral light curve of the burst shown uh, with the chime light curve uh, in orange uh, underneath it. And uh, you can see that uh, the, the two peaks of the counterpart uh, are leg a little bit uh, the radio burst. Uh, it wasn't just detected by integral. Many other telescopes were uh, looking at the source at the time uh, when it was an outburst. And um, they found, uh, they all found, came to similar conclusions that this was not really an exceptional burst in terms of uh, its brightness and, and flux, its, its, uh, its uh, X-ray flux was not exceptional compared to both uh, the bursts coming from SGR 1935 at the time and typical X-ray bursts from magnetars 
But what was uh, exceptional was that it was an outlier spectrally and had a much harder spectrum than other uh, X-ray bursts. Uh, so if we want to take uh, this event from SGR 1935 and play a game of what does this tell us for the FRB population? So this event gives us a uh, something tangible, uh, an observational, something observationally tangible to grab onto and uh, talk about uh, in the, um, the context of FRBs. So it gives us an X-ray to radio or gamma ray to radio ratio, depending on what band you're talking about here, uh, to, uh, to play with. And you know this certainly would apply to magnetars, but uh, in other source classes, it could apply if the emission mechanism is similar or even if the emission mechanism is different, as long as it has a similar uh, uh, efficiency between the two um, bands. Uh, so the, the energy range in the radio spanned by FRBs is something like 10 to the 35 times 10 to the 32. And if you multiply it by this efficiency, you get something like uh, 10 to the 41 to 10 to the 48. And that's what's represented in this blue band where I'm plotting in uh, against distance, so your, your source distance, and then your fluence, which is the types of limits you place using uh, telescopes in the X-ray and hard X-ray to gamma ray. Um, and that's assuming a spectra from uh, uh, the SJR 1935 first on April 28th. Uh, and I've also plotted using a, the, a spectra like that of the 2004 giant flare from SGR 1806, which is the brightest, most energetic thing we've seen from a magnetar in our galaxy, which is this orange line. And you can see that it's quite easily detected out to uh, distances of 100 megaparsecs and uh, to uh, the distance to FRB 1908-16b. Um, and so many telescopes have targeted two of our well-localized uh, FRBs. So the original repeater, FRB 121102, uh, the 16-day the periodic repeater, uh, FRB 1908-16, um, and place limits uh, in these, you know, uh, fluent, approximate fluence ranges. Um, and uh, uh, FRB 1908-16, especially, you know, starting to rule out the fact that a, a giant flare would be occurring at the time of these uh, fast radio bursts. Um, so just to calibrate ourselves, I don't talk much about uh, models in this talk, but uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, compare to models, uh, compare my, my blue band plot here to models is, uh, this is a, a plot from Metsch et al. 2019 for the synchrotron maser model. And in the you know, X-ray regime and the luminosities or the energies expected are something like 10 to the 43, 10 to the 45 ergs, which would put us you know, kind of in the middle of uh, the energetics here of my uh, efficiency scaled FRB population in the blue band. And uh, so if we had a source you know, closer than say 150 to 100 megaparsecs or so, we'd be in business for putting powerful limits on FRBs. And of course we do have a source, it's uh, FRB 2020-01-20E, which is the FRB on the outskirts of M81, as uh, Kenzie told us, localized to a globular cluster out in the halo of M81 by EVM. And uh, so this distance is only 3.6 megaparsecs. So, you know, great. If I plot that on my plot here, uh, you can see that we'd uh, be, that at that distance, uh, oops, a radio burst, uh, uh, assuming the, the scaling between radio and these high energies uh, that we see from SGR 1935, would be sensitive to six magnitudes out of the eight spanned by the FRB population. So we just need a typical, uh, you know, uh, say 10 to the 40 uh, erg or so um, burst, radio burst from uh, FRB 2020 
and then we'd be sensitive to SGR 1935. But uh, unfortunately, one of the issues are uh, when playing this game with SGR 1935's um, efficiency, X-ray to radio efficiency, is that the FRB 2020 one um, uh, 20, <laughs> I missed the 20 here, uh, bursts are aren't that energetic as uh, as uh, Kenzie showed as well. Um, and so they, taking those and scaling them by SGR 1935's uh, efficiency puts them, puts it below our detection limit. So what we need is either, uh, you know, this an, an FRB source like this or as close as this to have either be more efficient than um, SGR 1935 uh, relative between its radio and x-ray, or uh, a bright burst from this FRB, or an energetic burst from this FRB, or a similarly close FRB. And uh, we'd you know, uh, get some, either a detection, fingers crossed, or a quite interesting limit. Uh, so we're, we've also, we also observe uh, FRB 2020, or the M81 FRB to, um, at time scales other than just uh, at the time of radio, prompt counterparts at the time of radio bursts. And uh, so, for example, uh, we used an archival Chandra image, I think it's about a decade old in, uh, in the EVN localization paper to, uh, to place a limit on the X-ray luminosity. And so what is that limit sensitive to? So if you want to, you know, compare to our favorite magnetars that we tend to talk a lot about. Um, uh, you'd be sensitive to the tails of giant flares uh, using such observations. Uh, the, the prompt counterpart that we talk about with giant flares is the initial spike, which is can, is like 10 to the 47 uh, ergs per second for about uh, 100 milliseconds. But, um, but the tail itself is into the 10 to the 40s uh, in luminosity. And so, um, so we would be sensitive to that in such observations. And also it's comparable to the most luminous outburst that uh, outside of a giant flare that we saw, that we've seen in galactic magnetars, uh, which is about the same level for about a day, it was above that threshold for about a day. Uh, of course, uh, this M81 FRB does not exactly live in an environment that you'd expect young magnetars to live in, except for, um, alternative formation channels like accretion-induced collapse. So you could also compare to things like accreting systems. Uh, and so we can rule out ultra-luminous X-ray sources uh, using these types of, uh, using our X-ray observations. But that's, of course, is a little bit tautological because ultra-luminous X-ray sources are defined by their luminosity and uh, accreting systems do go to much lower luminosity. So there is room for, uh, for accreting systems in, um, uh, in that, that MA, in the, the globular cluster counter, globular cluster host environment there. Um, yeah, so we'll be presenting limits in, um, in an upcoming paper, uh, discussing this in more detail. Uh, okay, so thank you. I believe that's definitely about my time. And uh, yeah, so no high energies detected yet, except a notable exception, depending on uh, how you view SGR 1935. Um, and with nearby repeaters, we're starting to show that for these repeaters, at least, the counterparts don't seem to be the brightest. Uh, we can certainly rule out things like magnetar giant flares happening in these sources. Um, and so it, uh, yeah, and as we discover closer and closer sources, we are getting much closer at probing uh, interesting uh, energetics uh, for high energy counterparts. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, we have time for one question. Any question to Paul? All right. Thanks, Paul, then. Hey, thanks, Ben. Yeah, let's move on to Dong Zi.
you're muted. Oh, sorry. All right. Yeah, okay, uh, good. Uh, thanks everyone for giving me the chance to present on this conference. And I like, I'd like to talk about the long-term periodicity in the FRB first times. Um, as we all know that like time is very powerful in detecting uh, FRBs. And with its 1,024 beams scanning the sky daily, it gives us an, a new window to, to study the long-term periodicity on the time scale of 10 days to 100 days. And those long-term periodicity can give us very uh, can make the follow-up observation very efficient because you know the active window and also it gave us uh, unique uh, windows to study the progenitors. So in this presentation, I'd like to talk about first about the current status of our search with Chime FRB, and second, I'd like to talk about what we know about um, know more about the periodic source and some thoughts about it. Uh, so first, like uh, um, about the search. So we are performing regular searches with Chime FRB whenever we detect new births. And Aaron uh, Pierman is my main collaborator on doing this. And we tried various methods to do the search because different methods are sensitive to uh, periodicity uh, duty cycle of different shapes. And uh, and currently, time is most sensitive to for long term periodicity is most sensitive to 10 to 100 day periodicity, because mainly because below 10 days, especially below five days, because of the sidereal day, like the short exposure day, daily exposure, there will be a beat, beat of the sh there will be a degeneracy between like uh, daytime periodicity and hour long periodicity. So below five days, it's it's really this window where you get lots of contamination from short time scale periodicity. And, and, uh, and above 200 days, because we don't have enough like uh, sampling. So often you, we don't have enough active cycles for us, for us to confidently claim that there's a periodicity. There are some tentative candidates, but um, it's unknown that whether it's chance of coincidence or it's real periodicity. And the upper limits will get increased with, uh, with more exposure, like a longer monitoring. But the short, uh, the, the lower limit is difficult to get around because it's a, an intrinsic degeneracy between the short periodicity and long periodicity. And so, so this is, I specifically want to mention this because, um, because so, so for, for follow-ups, especially those regular follow-ups should consider like maybe probing this window, the long-term periodicity of hour to few days, which time is actually not so sensitive with. And um, the search is pretty straightforward. You just try different methods. However, the justification of whether there's a real periodicity is always very tricky because the uh, non-person nature of the, the birth arrival times. This is a very extreme example. For example, if you have nine births arrive in some period, period with duty cycle of 10% with three active cycles. So if it's a Poisson case, all nine births are independent, then you should have uh, the, the chance of coincidence is, is 0.1 to the power of eight, which is uh, 10 to the minus eight, which is really low. However, if it's non person means that if the burst always emit reburst whenever they emit burst, then actually it's, it's so easy for you to see a fake periodicity because the chance of coincidence is actually just 0.1 to the power of two, which can, can, can very easily uh, due to some chance of coincidence if you search more trials. So, so in order to really justify that there's a periodicity, we really need to observe enough active cycles because it's difficult to say that whether this clustering is due to periodicity or due to its nature. So um, this is a rough estimate of how many active cycles you really need. Because, because uh, whenever, if you, if you try searching periodicity of lo uh, lots of, like you try to search for lots of independent periodicity. So naturally, like it, it will increase your chance of finding one by 
by coincidence. So the number of trials of search is actually the number of independent peer review search times the number of FRB you search. You search more, the, there are more likely that you're getting some fake signal. And the required peer uh, active cycles, for example, for duty cycle of around 30%, which is the one we found periodically, you actually need at least 10 cycles for you to confident, confidently say that uh, there's a periodicity. And if the duty cycle gets larger, so for example, it gets to 50%, you actually need almost 20 active cycles to, for you to uh, claim that this is a periodicity. Um, so um, so that's why I, I think um, we have some candidates, but I don't think at a certain point, like it's, it's easy to justify. So, and this is the main challenging. And the second is like our bottleneck, like we are, time is detecting lots of, lots of repeaters. However, actually the number of source we could search is not as much as people would think. So this is a snapshot uh, I took a year ago about the most active repeaters in the Chime public website um, for ranking from most active to less active. And this is a year later. And the, situ the situation is actually not, not changed that much. We are adding two new repeaters because this one suddenly becomes very active and this one is special. And the, generically, you see that the number of bursts is not increasing a lot within a year. And also we're detecting lots of new repeaters, but most of the repeaters are like with two bursts or few bursts. So um, the number of repeater we could search is, is actually not that much. So at this stage, we uh, between five to a hundred days, we haven't found any convincing period with other time FRB repeaters. But I don't think this at this point show that the periodicity is rare, it's just, we don't have that many samples. And also for those new detected repeaters, we don't have that long like monitoring time to search for long periodicity. So this is the current stage um, of the search. But, uh, but with like, mm, as, the, I, as, as time goes by, we collect more birds, we detect more repeaters. And if there are more sensitive telescopes, there are more follow-ups we can which can compensate us in, in other uh, parameter space, um, there are chances that we'll detect more uh, periodic sources. And then the second part is I'd like to talk about the periodic source that we've already found, because even if it's one example, it actually tells us a lot of things. So last year, um, we find a 16 day periodicity with one of with the really the most active repeater in time samples. So until now we have 30, so this red line is when I first noticed this periodicity. So it's actually exactly around 10 active cycles at that time. So it's the bottom, like it's really the lower limit where we can claim that there's a periodicity. And, and then like now it still nicely follows this periodic pattern, it's still, having the periodicity and it doesn't become less active and it doesn't show obvious uh, derivative of periodicity. So it still nicely had this periodicity. And in, in this years, there are, uh, within this year, there are, uh, well, within the one year of discovering this source, there are lots of follow-ups of these sources, which is partly presented in Paul's talks. Um, the highlight is that it really because the high efficiency of follow-up, it really make the detection at other band easier. For example, it goes down to, um, to the low far band, which uh, fast radio bursts has never been found before. And also the interesting thing, is, oh yeah. Um, and also it, it triggers lots of thoughts about like the model to explain this periodicity. For example, you can divide it into a beaming like the emission, uh, the line of sight passing the emission region because of some rotation uh, motion and eclipsing, which is the, uh, the, the signal is periodically eclipsed by some material in the, in the system. And also emission, it might be some orbit and triggered by uh, existing thing like a, a asteroid belt or the companion wing. Um, 
and and this year's actually uh, some progress has been made to distinguishing those models. Um, for example, uh, the 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 follow up in other wavelengths up to L band and the low far band uh, show that the periodic window is actually uh, chain changing across frequency and it's it's uh, it's monotonically changing instead of getting wider or narrower. And also the as Kenzie said, the polarization angle actually doesn't change much across bursts in L band. And the source seems to be offset uh, from the nearby star forming region. And the first one is actually pretty cleanly rule out all the eclipse model because um, because all the eclipse is uh, it's more serious in lower frequency and the later phase of the active window where the high frequency emission stops while you still see the low frequency emission, it, it shouldn't happen because when the high frequency is eclipsed, the low frequency has to be eclipsed. So pure eclipse model has been ruled out in this case. And also because of this like shift in the active window, we are thinking about uh, beaming uh, like the emission region had a change of emission region is sort of natural to explain this behavior like because the the rotation is is independent of frequency and the orbit is independent of frequency what can be dependent with frequency is the emission region at uh, the location of the emission region which which is a natural thing and also thinking about the change in emission region so we know that the burst, uh, the, this FRB burst, get wider at lower frequency, and the active window gets larger at lower frequency. And also, there's downward drifting feature. So it's natural to think about the radius to frequency mapping, where at lower frequency the emission is close to the to the uh, surface of the neutron star. At high frequency, oh, sorry, at high fre frequency the burst. Uh, the emission region is close to the surface of the neutron star and it propagates out and reaching some larger emission region. And in this case, you can have narrower burst and narrower active window in higher frequency. And also this naturally uh, predicts some uh, downward drifting feature and the drift rate increase increases with the decrease of frequency. Um, so it's sort of natural to think about this kind of radius to frequency mapping. And lots of emission mechanism can predict this, uh, but we are not distinguishing it here. And also another clean thing to think about is if you have this kind of uh, radius to frequency mapping, you can think about the geometry of uh, different models, especially these oh, these three, um, the slow rotation and the free precession and the force precession, where you just involving the geometric uh, effect of this beaming instead of other complicated effect. And also, um, so uh, the, the angle can be uh, pretty, um, so different model all have this several different angles to constrain, but there are some common properties for you to make observation predictions. And, um, maybe I, it's getting too long. Um, so the, the, I, I'll leave this slides here for you to check how, how those models, uh, the difference between the free precession and the force precession is the Procession X, whether the procession axis is fixed on the body frame or fixed on the inertial frame of the of the plane. And that gives very different behavior in the observed properties. And with this very simple like uh, rotation of geometry, which is pretty straightforward, whatever mod, whatever emission region you in you you impose and whatever um, whatever angles you're imposing, some generic feature is like the, for the slow rotation and free precession, you can have this drift of active window. While for the 
force precession, it's it's impossible. It always has to be symmetric unless your precession uh, period is similar to the rotation period, which basically uh, still means that you need a 16 day slow rotation, then why, why bother use force precession? So, and also this model, although there are uncertainty of these angles, because this model uh, involves the change of uh, emission region, it actually can be tested with the polarization angle. And it doesn't have to wait for years to see the evolution, you can directly measure the uh, geometry of the system. So for the slow rotation model, um, at each phase, which is the 16 day period, uh, which is the spin phase, you have a specific uh, position angle. And will, it, will, it will change across the phase and it will change across the frequency. And for the free precession model, for each phase, it's, it's the precession phase. So you have an additional motion of the rotation. So, so the position angle can vary a little bit across each phase. And also, it also has to uh, vary across frequency. And same with the force precession. So in this case, if you have measurement of polarization angle across phase and across frequency, basically you can prove or rule out these two models and it will give us some, some understanding of what kind of system this is. Um, so in summary, so we perform regular searches on time FRB repeaters and currently the most sensitive window is 10 to 100 day period and we haven't find convincing candidates um, and also the FRB 1809-16B is still extremely active and still uh, nicely follows this periodicity after almost three years. And now that we know that there's a chromatic window seen in, in this source, and this can be nicely explained with a change of emission region across frequency, and this is testable with polarization angle uh, measurement across frequency. And thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, mm -hmm. Lose. Um, questions? I have a quick one. So um, yes. in some of the models, I think it's 11th uh, precession model. They mm -hmm. predict the drift of the phases as a function of time. Uh, is there any evidence of the drifting or um, when do we expect to see, uh, when, when do we expect to, to test that model? Uh, yeah, so the, the drift, at first, I haven't seen very convincing drift uh, uh, across time. And I think the time scale is probably 10 years for you to really see convincing. Uh, you mean it's sort of a P dot, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions to Dongzi? Hi, Dongzi, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so would you expect, yeah, maybe I'm not thinking about this correctly, but maybe would you expect that the polarization angle would like ha have a trend as opposed to just scatter um, within some range or would it go like uh, down and then up again uh, as a function of time? Uh, thanks for the question. So uh, as a function of time, it's, no, it's not so obvious, but, but as the function of uh, phase, so you expect a trend for the rotation model, but you expect some blobby thing for the precession model. So they would be scattered within that blob for, for the precession as opposed to a, a strict trend down. Exactly. Okay, okay. Uh so one comment is, I guess this is for dipole, right? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, yes. Yeah. So so when I generate those figures, I indeed uh, assume dipole field. But I think this kind of trend, it's it's more fluffy if you include other quadrupole, and also it's even more difficult to just. Yeah have no polarization angle change <laughs> and that that it the the idea is similar so you still expect this kind of trend for the um, 
rotation case and this kind of blobby thing for the procession case, even if you assume other magnetic uh, configuration. So what did you assume for the emission height? I guess that's important, I suppose, for uh, what the radio emission height. For the emission height. Uh, no, yeah. I, I, did, I didn't um, uh, use any specific emission height because it's sort of the I, I use some uh, emission height, but it's sort of degenerate with the gamma factor when I'm assuming the, um, the curvature radiation. And I think okay. at this point, I'm not really wanted to go into the detail of the emission mechanism. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a requirement because the polarization angle, if I want to demonstrate that angle, it's the angle between the, this is the line of sight, the angle between the magnetic pole and the ro uh, rotation axis. So you can imagine if the line of sight gets close to the magnetic pole, the change of polarization angle will be very large. And at a certain point, you expect the 90 degree jump, which is difficult to uh, reconcile with Kenzie's study of uh, stable PA across bursts. So this kind of uh, emission region change really um, gives you some constraint that the, the line of sight, the emission region has to be far away from the magnetic pole. It's not circumpolar. It has to be far from that, which is surprising that uh, if you have to work out in this way, it has to be far from the magnetic pole. All right, uh, thank you, Don. So we need to move on. Uh, Mickey will chair the rest of the session. Mickey, so please take over. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bing. And I'm happy to be chairing the remainder of the session. The next talk will be by Zorawar Wadi Singh on magnetar short bursts, um, the low twist model. You have, uh, can, you see, can you yes. see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is uh, basically a talk on the low twist model and some uh, phenomenology on, fat, on, on short bursts. And so it's some of it's in these papers, but I'm also going to show some uh, new results. And it's work with Andre Timokin, Paz, Benini, and others. Um, so the thing I think that clinches it for me that uh, say FRB 1211 is a magnetar is that the arrival time statistics are very magnetar-like. Not just, it's not just, so, so in this plot, I'm showing the arrival time versus the waiting time between subsequent bursts. And it's not just this, this log uniformity or log normal here. It's also this log uniformity in time. And just for comparison, this is a magnetar 2259, the short burst from it, and you see it's quite similar. Um, so the, the real unusual thing is this uh, sort of uh, uh, log uniformity in arrival times. And that's very strange in astrophysics. And the only place you see it in nature is earthquakes and solar flares and magnetars. So, this is, I think, sort of a smoking gun that at least 121102 is an isolated magnetar of some kind, or at least the bursts are magnetar-like, or the, presumably the same trigger. So what are magnetar short bursts? So if, if magnetar short bursts and FRBs have the same trigger, we have to understand magnetar short bursts, which is where most of the energy is. Um, so this, these are showing some typical magnetar short bursts, and they're, they're called short bursts because they're short. And they're much less energetic than giant flares, and they can occur in storms of hundreds, and they're fairly soft usually, but it can go up to several hundred kV. And uh, here are some examples in the X-rays and hard X-rays. So spectral analysis of these short bursts shows that uh, at least for some storms, like this is, I think, uh, uh, SGR 1550, um, the, the spectral analysis, when you do the actual uh, uh, analysis of each burst, you can fit them with uh, double black bodies. And these double black bodies have two different areas uh, and two different temperatures. But if you look at their luminosities in these two black bodies, they're fairly similar. So that is very unusual in itself. And that implies that it's some sort of, uh, these two black bodies are talking to each other in some way. And so that means that they're, it's probably in a closed zone uh, confined in a magnetosphere. And uh, and the bursts are such low energy that you can uh, easily maintain magnetic dominance. So that, that means that nothing is really going out. You may have these fast magnetosonic modes that uh, some people like to invoke, but in general, it, it's confined. 
Um, so this is sort of a general uh, cartoon. You have the burst and you have, this is a fairly common picture and you have a trapped fireball in the closed zone. So it is away from the pole a little bit, but it could be quasi-polar still. Uh, and you have different radiative processes going in. Um, the other interesting thing about magnetar short bursts is there's, there's this sort of universal power law uh, event size distribution for them, like earthquakes. So it's a, it's analogous to the uh, Gutenberg Richter law for earthquakes, and the index for magnetar short bursts is about minus one point seven for the number the differential rate uh, differential distribution. And this is first noticed by Chang, and this is some other examples where you see this, and it's universal between episodes and in individual magnetars and across different magnetars, and it's possibly related to how the crust uh, uh, undergoes failure similar to earthquakes. Um, okay, so this is a new result. Uh, this is a magnetar SGR 1830, and this is the, this has uh, been submitted. It's the first result of uh, what we see is the periodic windowing of bursts, the hard X-ray bursts or the soft X-ray bursts. Uh, so the gray here is the surface thermal emission in the magnetar, and the histogram here is the number of bursts as a function of phase. So this is the first time, at least at high significance, it's been demonstrated that the magnetar bursts can be periodically windowed. And that implies uh, it's, it's occurring very, very close to the surface. Um, but before I go that, okay, so what's happening here, or what should I say is that the surface thermal emission here is beamed in a magnetized atmosphere. In magnetars, you have a magnetized atmosphere and well below the cyclotron resonance, which is what's relevant for soft X-rays, um, the, the cross-section is suppressed. And what that means is that you get these sort of pencil beam-like structures um, for the rate, for the X-rays. And so this is sort of quasi-polar and the bursts are sort of quasi-polar, at least it seems that way, but they also have to be low altitude. Uh, so uh, this is some uh, ray tracing simulation. This is just showing that even at one stellar radii, you cannot hide a burst behind. Um, so this is uh, just showing different quantities for the ray tracing simulation. And the relevant thing here is just that you can see the whole burst even if it's behind you, behind the observer. Uh, the other, okay, this is just showing that uh, there's other effects like time delays and energy dependent time delays in the X-rays that will be interesting to probe uh, later on, but it's not that relevant to this talk. Okay, so going on to the FRB uh, stuff. So we don't know exactly what the pulsar emission mechanism is, but we know it works and it requires some sort of low entropy plasma. Um, and we know there is a pulsar death line. Um, and we know that the necessary condition for pulsar emission is the pair cascades. Uh, these are magnetic pair cascades. You have some accelerating electric field. You make either curvature photons or resonant inverse Compton photons, and they pair produce, uh, uh, giving a cascade. And uh, it turns out it could also, this necessary condi the condition could also be a sufficient condition uh, because uh, Andre way back when showed that the, in, these non, in these pair cascades, you have non-uniformity of the discharges. So the, the process is inherently uh, non-stationary. This is just showing the phase space in 1D. In 1D, you can actually resolve the scales in a sort of a pulsar-like uh, parameters. Um, this is just showing the, uh, the electron positrons and the photons. And the bottom panel here is showing the electrostatic waves that you get in the simulation. And the interesting thing here is that these electrostatic waves are superluminal. Uh, uh, where these lines are just is the speed of light. It, this has now been demonstrated in 2D and in, uh, with, uh, in, with the Sasa Filipov. And there you require the pair formation front to be uh, at an angle. And you also get these waves and they're electromagnetic O modes rather than the electrostatic ones that I think was talked about in a previous talk. So, so what is this model? So we propose that there, there's some uh, mechanism in the closed zone largely uh, because the open zone of a magnetar is tiny uh, that disturbs the magnetosphere. And the closed zone in magnetars are normally filled with some dense plasma due to the twist of the fields. And, uh, but okay, the polar zone may be also involved. Uh, so the, the assumption here is that the, the disturbance disturbs this uh, low twist zone and the plasma cannot screen it. And so it has to generate these pair cascades and that 
if you if you believe the model, this necessary and sufficient condition of these pair cascades, these intense pair cascades, then you then you get the the superlumen all modes, and you get pulsar-like emission mechanism. Um, so this is just showing what the twisted. These are some toy models of twisted magnetospheres, and then the twisted magnetospheres, axi axisymmetric twisted magnetospheres. The polar zone is sort of or quasi-polar zone is sort of untwisted. Uh, this is just sort of the characteristic. Uh, plasma density required to uh, make the hard tails in magnetars. So you can see it's super gold right Julian. And so you need a plasma density much lower than this in the, in the low twist model. So, okay, so the, the idea is that you have some uh, disturbance and this disturbance we think is actually crustal oscillations. It turns out that the shear modes or S modes or torsional modes uh, are the most likely eigenmodes transmitted through the crust. This is showed in Blaise Blanford, uh, 1989. And it's, it's thought that these oscillations dampen less than a second. And the characteristic frequency of these oscillations is tens to hundreds of hertz uh, for the, the uh, n equals zero uh, modes of these torsional oscillations. And you, so, you, so these oscillations require an electric field. Uh, these ele the, the, the low twist condition is basically that the, the, the requirement is larger than what's available. And so you have to create plasma and that those are the avalanche pair cascades. And okay, so the magnetic dominance condition that's, I've talked about this, it's already sort of satisfied. So, so the energy scale and also why there are, why only some short bursts make FRBs is basically going to the low crisp condition. The energy scale is that it's crust oscillations now that rather than rotationally driven. So the area is larger and the amplitude is larger. And so that can, the energy scale sort of naturally comes out from this, that the, you get several orders of magnitude difference in energy between the rotation powered pulsars and these magnetar uh, oscillation driven uh, FRBs. The other interesting thing is that the power law, this universal power law between the, the short bursts and the FRBs that you see, the, the, for, for example, this is the chime repeater, um, the, the efficiency has to run uh, with energy so that the efficiency is not constant. And if you assume that, and of course we know that the magnetar short bursts are quasi-thermal, so they're sort of calimetric to the energy. So if you assume that, that, that the, the, the short bursts are sort of scaled with the pointing flux of the oscillation or disturbance, then you can naturally get a much steeper power law if, you, if, the, if the pulsar like emission mechanism goes as the voltage. Uh, and this voltage scaling is also seen in pulsars. So, so if this universal power law is there in magnetars and FRBs, then the natural uh, power law for FRBs, at least at the high energy limit, is also a power law, but a steeper power law. Uh, so you, once you have this sort of correspondence, you can play games with the luminosity function. So if, assuming a single eigenmode, now it seems like in Dealey's talk that you have sort of islands of energy, right? And so it could be multiple eigenmodes going on. But okay, a sim single eigenmode, you have a fairly narrow luminosity function that some cuts off somewhere near 10 to the 36 or something of that order, assuming no beaming. The beaming could also play a role. And in this case, if the, if the twist is low, the limiting thing is the gold right Julian density. So long periods are preferred for FRB production. You can get a death line like this assuming magnetic dominance and the low twist condition. And you get a minimum period because uh, that, that's basically, you, you have too much charge density once you go below this period. Um, the other interesting thing is these long period magnetars. So there is, the interesting aspect here is there is a magnetar in our galaxy that has a spin period of 6.7 hours. And so the idea here is that perhaps these other long periodicities are these slowly rotating magnetars. And that constrains the emission mechanism because uh, for example, Yuri's model of the current sheet reconnection doesn't work in, if this is the case because uh, there is no current sheet in a very long spin period magnetar. So if you see radio emission from a very long spin period magnetar that sort of rules out the sort of current sheet reconnection model for radio emission in that system. Um, and in this paper with Paz, we go into how you could possibly make these systems and they're rare. Uh, that bottom line is they're rare, but they can overproduce the FRBs because the, the charge density in them is so low. And so it sort of compensates. 
and you can get sort of a distribution of these systems. You can reproduce the general pulsar po magnetar population, this little hump here in the period distribution, and then you get this long tail of these ultra long period magnetars. Uh, uh, this was already talked about, but the, the long periodicity also kind of rule, uh, with apertif rules out the bi simple binary models. You could have something more complicated like the comb model, but the simple uh, sort of shrouding is sort of ruled out. Uh, so the advantages of the low twist model is, of course, the not, not all short bursts make FRBs because only some of the field lines have no twist and no, no strong beaming collimation required, although it's certainly possible, at least for the periodicity. Uh, but the, the beaming is sort of mild. It's like 10% or 20%. You don't need a 10 to the minus four beaming cone in this model. Um, the radio energetics, it depends on the volume of the untwisted field and the active region and the mode, which couple are the surface area. Uh, the voltage scaling is there's, there's a threshold condition because of this voltage scaling, because the, the efficiency runs, it's not constant as a function of amplitude. So, um, you naturally also that this way also have a lower energy scale. Uh, the high polarization degree is sort of uh, easy for a magnetospheric model because uh, you have spalumal O modes and they, they that's that you have this adiabatic walking of the O modes in the magnetosphere. Uh, the time delay, if the burst is triggered by this sort of dislocation, then the pair cascades start first, and then you have the radio emission, and then you have the compensation and the, and the high energy emission in the fireball. The frequency drifts, that's uh, sort of, could be standard pulsar to radius frequency mapping. And yeah, so then the crustal oscillations, I think is very interesting. It could possibly be something uh, uh, that we can uh, actually use to constrain the, the neutron star equation of states. So let me talk about SGR 1935. So, as I mentioned before, the surface thermal emission here is beamed because of the, the radiative transport in the surface layer. So this is possible. Pos the field here is sort of parallel to the observer when this when you see this peak in the X-rays. And so the, the, that fact that the FRB is sort of coincident with this is, I think, strong evidence for a, ma a magnetospheric model um, origin for the burst and also uh, sort of a closed zone associated with this active region. Now, in the right panels here, you can see that there were lots of bursts. Although there were only 200 or a few hundred observed, uh, you can see the time sampling here was not uniform. There were probably thousands of bursts that we didn't see that occurred during this time. And there, there's some storms here as well. And uh, uh, so, as mentioned before, the burst time properties are very similar to other magnetar bursts. Only, the only interesting aspect here was that the, the uh, the, the burst was more spectrally extended and softer. Um, and that, that probably points to a sort of quasi-polar origin of the burst location. The, the most interesting part, I think, is that the, the radio was pre radio preceded the hard X-rays in integral by a few milliseconds. And that's exactly what you'd expect if the pair cascades happen first and then the compensation occurs. The other interesting aspect here is in the HMXT uh, data preprint, I guess it's still a preprint. Uh, the second version of it shows this, this sort of a very interesting QPO-like structure here in the, in the medium energy band where, and it turns out this is also least affected by dead time. And this period is 30 to 40 Hertz. And that's exactly sort of what you expect for the L equals two, N equals zero torsional mode. Um, for a sort of a standard neutron star. So, so that's the FRB transit because you see two, two radio pulses here. Um, so you, if, because you see radio, some FRBs with radio pulses and in, in, in trains and also in the waiting time distribution, D. Lee also showed this, you have a very strong clustering at low, you have a gap here and then sort of a cluster at low waiting time. So, so the, fact, the fact that there's a gap there is also significant. And then you have this cluster of low short waiting times. And that we think is the crustal oscillation signature. And you see the crustal, these QPOs in magnetars. So this is the, the giant flare tail of SGR 1806. And you see these discrete, this discrete bands of QPOs, a 30 Hertz, something at 50 or 60 Hertz at 90 Hertz, and then even higher. And this discrete band is also only seen in preferential rotation phases. So 
it's something close to the surface and it's it's exciting the magnetar in these discrete modes, portional modes that are most easily transmitted through the crust. Uh, so um, these are some models of uh, what you'd expect for different equations of state. And uh, for so it turns out here you need a crust and a, and a core equation of state because the crust is the key here for the torsional modes. And to, the, the key thing to remember for FRBs is you also have to correct for the redshift. Uh, so this is some uh, pre very preliminary data we plotted in this paper. And okay, this is just showing the sort of the equation of state dependence of the, these modes. So the higher mass, higher, higher mass ones have lower modes for this fundamental uh, 2F0 mode or L equals 2, uh, N equals 0 uh, mode, torsional mode. And it turns out if you in introduce some magnetic fields, the mode frequency rises. But uh, for this B, B mu here is the, the scale where the, the energy density of the, uh, in the crust is sort of equal to the, the, in the ions is equal to the sort of binding energy. And so this is about 10 to, few times 10 to the 15. So most magnetars are in this regime here. Only very extreme young magnetars would be in this regime. Um, so the idea is what is the distribution of excited modes? So uh, there's some uh, distribution to them, right? So what is the width uh, of all the FRBs? What is the separation? That tells you the equation of state. And the, the, the relative uh, uh, height of these tells you which modes are excited. And so this is a sort of a toy model of different equations of state. And it turns out you need a few hundred uh, FRB trains to really start to uh, nail down sort of the differences between the equations of state. And the interesting thing here is the crust equation of state is something that's hard to get from other messengers. So for binary neutron star mergers, you have the tidal deformability, but that doesn't tell you much about the crust equation of state. So I think FRBs have a unique way of uh, sort of constraining the crust equation of state. If you can get a large sample of these trains and, and really and correct for the redshift, so you have to get redshifts for your FRBs and then correct and then plot the distribution of trains. Um, th there was a tantalizing thing but shown by D. Lee here. So, so the, this is the waiting time distribution of FRB 1201 you have the main thing, which is probably associated with the crustal uh, self-organized criticality. Uh, then you have this gap, right? And these are the trains. And so this little hump, I don't know how significant it is, but it's probably not very significant, but there is a hump there. And this would correspond to the sort of the fundamental mode of the, the 30 Hertz uh, L equals two. And this could be the other modes. Now there's also lots of trick, uh, or, or not tricks, but uh, subtlety here associated with uh, de-dispersion, right? So how you de-disperse is probably influencing things here. But the fact that the, there's a gap and then there's this little hump here is I think quite interesting. Um, so I'll leave this slide here. So the open questions are really, what is the magnetar burst mechanism? Is it, is it uh, internal? Is it a cross-driven uh, event or is it a sort of a reconnection event slightly higher up that then couples to the crust? Either way, it has to couple to the crust because we see key POs in magnetar short bursts in our galaxy. Um, the, 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 the radio mechanism is also probably uh, quite interesting to, to think about in terms of the periodic windowing. How do the ultra long period mag magnetars fit into the FRB landscape? We know there's at least one in our galaxy. Uh, does it have radio emission? I don't know. Uh, are there clusters of trains? And can we use that to constrain the neutron star equation of state? And the final thing is, I think, uh, the, to get these extragalactic counterparts. And I think we would need something, I think, dedicated. And, uh, Theseus may, may do it, but I think the real goal would be actually design an instrument that actually searches for these. And that's something I'm thinking about. OK. Um... Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are a, li uh, went a little bit over time. And so uh, to ensure there's time for the discussion, how about we have just, just one question, one quick question, okay. uh, if there are any. Yeah, so can I quickly ask? Um, so for the, uh, uh, most of the gamma ray bursts were not associated with the FRBs and actually 
not even any radio pulse as seen by FAST. Right. So how, do you, how do you explain that? So the radio pulses that FAST saw in October is, is pulsar-like, and we think that's rotationally driven. So what happened was that, at least what I think happened is, this FRB was a peculiar low, low uh, twist state, and then the magnetar continued to untwist. And then in, in October, uh, when things calmed down, it was a really low twist state that uh, you started to have the rotationally driven emission. So the polar caps started to pair produce. Yeah, that is the radio emission. I'm talking about the gamma ray emission without the radio. So there are many other right. RX reverse without any radio. Right, so that's the low twist condition. So you have, in those cases, the, the charge density is sufficient that uh, you, you, you don't make these uh, avalanche pair cascades. You just Comptonize, you make alphane waves and the alphane waves cascade and you make a fireball that way. All right, thanks. Okay, thank, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. And I, I just can't help but notice it's so timely because the source is active again, according to GCNs and ATELs in the last uh, 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. Uh, we will hopefully learn more soon. And I think we have to move now to uh, the last talk of the session, which is by Amanda Weltman uh, on um, a theorist wish list for FRBs. I am sharing screen. Okay. So thank you so much for the um, invitation and opportunity to talk at this meeting. It's always an absolute privilege to be able to attend these meetings in person, especially, but also during the pandemic with everything going on, it mm -hmm. feels like a privilege to escape um, some of the regular everyday life. So I took the title of the workshop and slightly switched the words around in the sense that um, the meetings I've gone to in the past have been very much less data driven. There have been fewer uh, FRBs that have been seen. And really in the last year, it seems that there's this huge burst in bursts. Um, and so many have been seen. And there's a lot that's been covered over the workshop um, it was definitely too ambitious to try to capture everything from the workshop, but I wanted to try and uh, give across a sense of the sorts of problems that I hope we're going to be able to answer um, in the coming years as we get more and more bursts. So uh, hopefully this isn't too um, uh, removed from exact data, but unfortunately, as a theorist whose experiment is currently under construction, I have no, I have no data to show you, but a dog who's very stressed out at the image of herself in the glass, sorry. Um, so I, I took this slide from, from other talks that I've given, obviously in my other life. Um, and I just thought it was interesting to flash up to show that th this is the list of problems that I've been interested in, in the course of my career, that they haven't really changed much. And most of them are, are unanswered, uh, maybe unanswerable. And it's been really remarkable to be working in FRBs just for a couple of years and to see how many of the problems people pose and then they're answered very quickly uh, within a year or so even. And also how many of those problems, of these big problems that I'm worried about can actually be answered with FRBs. So I'm gonna try to um, tackle that question tonight and say, well, what, what, can, we, what can we answer with FRBs? Um, so in terms of, I think if you, if you were here on Monday, which most people were, you will have seen the, the talk by um, Anastasia uh, Fialkov, and you would have seen, I think, similar concepts here of, of what, where we are in cosmology. So the big drive has been for the last you know, several decades to do really more and more precise precision cosmology. So uh, you know, getting smaller and smaller, uh, error bars and greater accuracy on each of our parameters, having fewer parameters. Ideally, if you pair cosmology with fundamental physics, you would be able to say this is where your parameters come from, from some fundamental theory that maybe has only one free parameter in it. I include the image on the left to illustrate the fact that most of our information that everything is built on is coming from those first few seconds, so the very far out, if we're looking backwards in time, 
that's what that image is, the very far out part of the universe or the very early universe. And then we have a whole lot of information coming from the galaxies. There's a sort of gap in the intermediate volume. And I think it's going to be very important for the coming years to really probe that gap. And in some sense, FRBs should be able to do that, which I'll come to shortly. So in terms of the big open problems, I think um, you know the nature of dark energy and dark matter are key. What is the driver of inflation is, is also key. What happened to the missing baryons, a problem I'll mention a little later on, but has essentially been resolved, I think, by FRBs, which is quite remarkable. Understanding galaxy formation, and of course, the, the overriding concern, I think of the last couple of years, people have talked a lot about this H0 problem. The overriding concern is that more data should bring you uh, greater accuracy and greater precision. It's not doing that with the Hubble constant. So over the years, um, I'll show you this just because it's so nice to see all the data squashed onto one image. But over the years, instead of there being a convergence on what H0 is, uh, there is a divergence. So the, the, two, the two original uh, estimates were within error bars of each other and they've just gotten further and further out. The error bars are getting smaller, but so are the central values. So instead of moving within each other's error bars, they're moving further out. So that's a, that's a big problem for cosmology. So we've, we're, we've gone from an era that was completely philosophical, you know, Einstein's beliefs almost, uh, almost towards total precision where we're observing and we're able to say really uh, clean things about uh, parameter estimates, but um, the, the extra data has not moved us towards the concordance that we expected, certainly when I started working in the field um, more than a decade ago. So let's look at some of the big problems one by one and where FRBs are bringing uh, power and, and great use. So dark matter, I'm sure the, the all of you understand how dark matter has been understood over time and why we believe so much of it exists. What's quite remarkable is that the physics is actually extremely simple, right? You can explain this to the general public. You can explain it to first year students, just the way we, we measure the total, we measure the total mass um, of a system by just looking at the velocity of the objects far out and the prediction without dark matter just doesn't match what we observe. And so it's really quite remarkable how simple the physics is there. And yet with this simple physics from you know, 1930s building up to the 1970s, relatively simple observations, we've got nowhere actually in, in our progress in dark matter. So in terms of theories, there's a host of theories. This plot is just one. There are many different ways that people try to organize their theories of dark matter. They're all terrible. None of them actually capture in any real sense where we are because essentially dark matter, there's no good theory. That's, that's the honest appraisal. That's my honest appraisal. There's no good theory for dark matter. There's no theory that sort of descends from any uh, gravitational theory that feels believable. Everything is ad hoc. There's no direct detection. So that's also just a, a great failing on the part of us as, as particle physicists in the sense that we've built these amazing detectors and every single experiment finds that dark matter if, is, easy to evade. So we just, we haven't seen it in any direct detection experiments. So the only real tool we have is indirect observations. And we have to come up with new observational tools because the ones we have are not getting us uh, very far. And so FRBs are remarkably powerful in this sense. So the specific example that I bring here, and um, I, I want you to see that there's big progress between the theory idea and the experiment idea just in a couple of years. So in 2016, uh, uh, Julian Munoz and others put out this very nice paper that explained that if dark matter is compact objects, then we would be able to see uh, dark matter with transients, right? In particular, with different kinds of transients, but for the purpose of this meeting with FRBs, in particular, the FRBs would have echoes or they would have um, uh, repeat re repetitions. There would either be lots of them or just a double peak, so like an echo, depending on the kind of lensing effect that's going on. Compact objects as dark matter were not particularly compelling. They were just possible, and uh, it was already ruled out that they couldn't be more than 35% of the total dark matter, so maybe there's some. What made them quite compelling in the last few years is the fact that the LIGO-Virgo uh, energy range for black holes happens to be 10 to 100 
solar masses. And so th that range is very poorly constrained. People weren't that interested in it because we didn't really expect to get that many black holes in that range. And yet it turns out that that's where we are seeing them, possibly in uh, observational bias, but that's where we're seeing them with LIGO. So the possibility of primordial black holes that we, that we hadn't really thought about very much uh, being a compelling dark matter candidate is back as a possible dark matter candidate. And it's exactly that range that FRBs would do so well at constraining. So since this uh, proposal, there were two papers last year, one of them with actual ASCAP data, where they show that using the substructure in these very short timescale uh, bursts, you can, um, if you have enough of them, sort of 100 plus, you can get new and better constraints on these macho constraints, on machos just being compact objects uh, that, that would serve as dark matter. So <clears throat> the redshift range there is, of course, because that is the where ASCAP was able to observe these FRBs. The other result showed that using all known FRBs, now bear in mind, this was, uh, I think, June last year. So there were only 110 FRBs at that point. If you were to do this again today, you have, I think, 500 plus that are published. And so it's a different story, right? But they are able to sort of break the degeneracy between substructure and lensing. So I'm gonna show you some pulses later, but I'm sure you've all seen this in your own data. There's all the structure in the FRB. And so you might think in the pulse, you might think that that is, um, you know, one pulse that's now lensed, is it an echo or is it actually intrinsic substructure? And to do that, you need more data and they, and they explain that they use dynamic spectra to do it. And there's no evidence um, within existing FRBs. They literally looked at the pulses of every one of these 110 FRBs. So I think there's a lot of exciting stuff for the future here. We're going to get much better constraints when we have more FRBs. Shorter lived FRBs should give us better constraints and obviously higher redshift. So right now the, the bulk of the uh, FRBs seem to be in, in low redshifts, which is not surprising, right? It's easier to see things that are closer to us. Um, but if we're able to get a lot of them <clears throat> at high redshifts, we should be able to do a lot more. And I think this process is going to have to be automated to a large extent. There's no way to look <clears throat> at all those shapes one by one and, and you know, make uh, and analyze them once we're talking thousands. So far worse than the situation with dark matter is dark energy. Dark energy is even less well understood. It's more recently um, accepted. So in the 80s, there were hints, but it was only in the 90s. I remember when I, when I was an uh, undergrad, they talked about the um, deceleration parameter because people were certain that the universe was decelerating. The acceleration only really got accepted in the 90s, even though now in retrospect, it's clear that the evidence was there already from structure formation um, observations from the 80s. So <clears throat> the point is here is the only way to make things work is to have the bulk of the energy component of the universe to be so-called dark energy. And dark energy is a disaster from a theoretical standpoint in the sense that the only really compelling candidate is a cosmological constant, but there's no way to get that constant value. There's no way to explain why that value is so tiny, um, literally 10 to the minus 123 in natural, in natural units. So there's no way to explain that size. And there's absolutely no good compelling way to explain why it dominates our universe now. So if it had dominated any earlier structure wouldn't have been able to form, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. If it dominated any later, um, if it dominated any later, we wouldn't see it, right? So it happens to switch on at a time scale that we can both exist and observe. It just seems far, far too unrealistic and unlikely. And so dark energy is an even more embarrassing problem in some sense in cosmology that we've made relatively little progress on, in part because there are degeneracies in our data. Most of our data comes from the early very early universe, so there's degeneracies with expansion rates and with curvature and in part because we just don't have good theoretical candidates and direct detection experiments are extremely limited, much worse than dark matter. So again, this is a fantastic opportunity for FRBs, I think. Um, for the most part, the, the, what I'm saying here is actually forecasting. I can't give you uh, results papers yet. And that's because I think to do a really good job, you need enough uh, bursts ideally at high redshift. So you want to be able to ignore 
local effects and you want to be able to push out to very high redshift. So that's really um, the ideal, that's really the ideal goal. And if you could get sort of tens of thousands of them with known redshifts, you could do better than baryon acoustic oscillations, which is really a big statement, especially for those of you who may be landed up working um, on experiments like CHIME that have the second half of the experiment is actually a BAO experiment, like CHIME and Hyrax is the same, you realize that actually the transient part might be able to contribute as much to cosmology as the cosmology part. I think that's really a, a sort of a key insight and it might explain to you why as a cosmology person, I'm more excited about the FRB side of our cosmology experiment. But the other central point is that if you, if you are willing to uh, go to some work and cross correlate, put together the data that you have from the CMB and BAO and then also, so that's old data and data from nearby stuff, gravitational waves and FRBs, you should be able to get far better constraints than we already have on both dark energy and on the Hubble constant. So the Hubble constant is not very much discussed here, but uh, once you have multiple um, multiple sets of data, you can get your, your, your ellipses are orthogonal and so you can break degeneracies that you cannot do with the CMB alone. So again, to do better here, we need far more FRBs, ideally high redshift FRBs. I don't know how unrealistic that is. I would love to, to know. Um, and if you can get them to be associated with other objects, that's also very helpful. So if you can take, so the cross correlation data that CHIME have done, if you can do that with, with other uh, uh, objects in the sky. So GRBs or possibly even quasars, you can get other information that will allow you to do far more uh, for dark energy. So um, another big picture possibility is fundamental physics questions. So here I mean specifically the fact that if the photon had mass, that would imply that all of our known laws of physics are wrong, basically. Gra the, well, the theory of gravity would be changed. Einstein's equivalence principle would be changed. Um, and we would need a new, a really a new theory. So there's the possibility to both test the mass of the photon and to test the weak equivalence principle. So there the photon is still massless, but um, at different energy photons fall at different rates essentially. So just a reminder of what the weak equivalence principle is, it's the same as universality of free fall. So the old um, leaning tower of Pisa experiment, you drop two objects of different type and if they fall at a differential a differential acceleration, then you would be very concerned. You would say, well, there's some extra force between them that's making one of them fall faster. Their, their intrinsic comp composition should not make a difference. And so on cosmological astrophysical scales, you can do this with photons. Essentially, photons of different energy would follow different trajectories, and you would get a slightly different time delay. So the time of arrival of different frequency components would be shifted slightly. So when we look at that time delay in our data, most of it is due to the dispersion measure, of course, but there's a component that's due to special relativity. There's a component that could be due to the photon mass if it had mass. And there's a component that could be due to a weak equivalence principle violating effect. So some kind of fifth force. And you know, with the discovery of the substructure in 121102, it became possible to get new best constraints on both the mass of the photon and gamma one minus gamma two, which is the weak equivalence principle violating component. That's the Shapiro time delay essentially between the two. You can do so much better if you have lots of FRBs, if you're able to look at all the substructure. So 121102 is so well studied, but they're now a whole bunch of repeaters from CHIME. If you study some of those and their substructure more, you may get far better constraints than uh, we already have. So that's really quite exciting. And of course, if we have very high redshift repeaters, we can get much better constraints because they're traveling over such a big distance and the distance, the redshift factors in there in the denominator. So it will always make your constraints much, much stronger. So I think there's a lot of very, very exciting stuff to do. I, I've included, I don't want to explain uh, the details of FRB 121102 to an audience that knows more than me on every detail, except to show you the importance of understanding um, the structure. And when I look at these, this, this has been a real awakening for me to understand that what looks like a pulse from far away, when you zoom in on it, the pulse has these details within it that are either telling you something about the environment 
or they're telling you something about the physics between us, the environment between us and the source. And figuring out how to break that degeneracy for multiple such objects is going to be very important. So I have all the pulses from um, this particular observing campaign and you can see they all look different. I just, it, it, it's a confusion to me as to why and what that's telling us and what we can learn from it. Most of them have that sad trombone, but it's not, not necessarily all. So I don't think I've heard the sad trombone mentioned today. Maybe I missed it. So hopefully one thing you've got out of this is the importance of probing the full cosmic volume. So we know a lot from the very recent universe. We know a lot from the very early universe, but that whole stack in the middle is giving us the potential to learn a lot. And we need to figure out how best to probe it. So intensity mapping will be one way. And that will be uh, extremely powerful um, because we will be able to look at the, the red shifted lines, not just the 21 centimeter lines, also the other ones. But if you look in that range of red shift there to get to reionization, you're at red shift sort of six or higher. And if there are a whole bunch of FRBs in between us and red shift six, you're probing almost that full volume that really needs to be studied. So there's great potential, I think, for FRBs. Um, just, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but just as a sort of last point, I want to highlight the key in localization. So if we know where they are, we can understand far better the environment. And I've taken this image straight out of the Chime paper. I love it. It's such a gorgeous image. I don't know. I love the colors and the way it's done, but the, the mapping is not necessarily natural to the eye. So, um, but maybe it's very obvious to all of you, but the fact that this essentially is the Northern hemisphere in that mapping, it'll be extremely important to fill out the other half. And so it'll be amazing to have Hyrax up and running and have sort of the full sky available to us to be able to do, you know, true full cross correlation studies and understand what patterns there are and what we can learn by putting together completely different data sets. Um, and the importance of localization, I think, has been realized. A few people have mentioned it today and I think also on Monday. Chime is going to get there very soon. Hyrax will as well. The design of Hyrax is to uh, include this localization. I don't have an equivalent milliarc second resolution claim, um, but it's but the, the idea is to be sub arc second. So hopefully it'll be as as good um, in the long run. So in terms of the wish list, I've included it here. So dark matter, I think we're making great progress. I included those two papers. Dark energy, the theories there, the constraints are still to come. Curvature, the, the theory is there, constraints are still to come. The early universe, the epoch of realization was already discussed um, on Monday, but I thought it's worth including there. In terms of fundamental questions about physics, there's a lot more I think we can do, though people are already producing results. In terms of understanding the nature of FRBs and FRB environments, this is clearly something that everybody is interested in. Same with FRB morphology. Everybody's interested in this and this will come naturally on its own, I think, but it will teach us things maybe that we hadn't really thought to ask before. The missing baryon problem, I think is essentially solved, which is quite remarkable. And then in terms of polarization, I think, you know, there's a lot to be learned if we can understand what, why, there seems to be a varied range of polarization of FRBs. You know, the first time I heard about FRBs was actually in the context of cosmic strings. And then they were sort of stopped talking about because there was one observed with the wrong polarization. But there may be far more to the story than that. So I think understanding the polarization might teach us things we hadn't thought about and understanding their distribution in space and time. So do they go as far out in redshift as uh, we would need them to, or are they really only recent? Why do we keep seeing them in different types of galaxies and how are they distributed across galaxies? Are they, I think I've said this before, but are they spread like you know, butter on toast or do they tend to be by the crusts? Are they at the edges and why? And what can we learn from that? So I think that understanding those things will come with fantastic localizations, huge amounts of uh, more data and just a sort of willingness to ask lots of questions. I'm always reminded of the fact that we keep, we've done so many studies on what's going on with FRB 121102. And now there are so many more repeaters since then, but there's not been any of the depth of studies. So if we can shift away from the observational bias and study in some equal way what we get, then I think there's going to be great uh, potential for progress. 
And I love this quote uh, by Dirac, but I would just change it in this context to if you are receptive and humble, the data will lead you by the hand. So yeah, hopefully I haven't pushed the discussion to be too late. Thank you again for having me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Very, very interesting talk. Um, I did want to leave the... Hello, sir? Splendid talk. Ah, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rima. Um, I, I do want to leave time for the discussion. So why don't we again um, uh, allow uh, one question uh, for Amanda, and then we'll switch directly to the discussion. Uh, we'll we'll uh, forego the break uh, to give them more time. So anybody have a question for Amanda? Um, I did have a comment or a quite the um, for for chime and um, uh, we do have a student uh, looking uh, at GRBs uh, to see if there's any um, uh, coincidences. Uh, Alice Curtin and Sri Harsh Tendulkar are looking at that, and so far we haven't actually seen any. I see Stefan also has a, a, a question he wants. Stefan, I don't. We don't hear you. I think you're on mute, Stefan. Still can't hear you. Uh, My device does this to me as well. The Zoom takes over the microphone and then it's gone. Okay, so perhaps I'll write it later. Uh, um, if there, I don't uh, see uh, any uh, other fruit. Ah, okay, go ahead. Yes, please. So, sorry for the delay. Um, yes, you mentioned the fundamental physics part. You, uh, you mentioned that the we have to have the time delay. How can we distinguish that from the normal dispersion? Is it because it's a different frequency dependence or could you like look at different batch of scaling of this effects? So the, the bulk of it is going to come from the dispersion measure. And then you need to look, so then you, if you're looking at say a whole peak, you assume that whole peak has really arrived at the same uh, DM. And then you're looking within the substructure. So you get terrible constraints just from a peak. I think it was the realization by Jason that, and others, I guess, that there was substructure in the peaks that allows you to get better constraints. Um, that's one option. The other option is uh, looking at different bursts. So photons from different bursts, you get much weaker constraints comparing two burst photons to each other. So there are multiple things you can do there. And I think, yeah. Okay, Very thanks. Creative. People are going to do even better. Okay, um, thank you very much, Amanda. I think we have to move directly to the discussions because since we don't have a lot of time left for that, uh, we had three um, discussion leaders who were identified and I'm gonna propose we proceed uh, by each of them uh, uh, taking uh, say one or two minutes to put forth their discussion questions, what they would like to discuss, and then we'll open the floor uh, to everybody uh, to jump in and tackle whichever of the questions uh, they think is uh, particularly interesting. Um, and so for the discussion leaders, I think we can go alphabetically by by surname, uh, just because that's a reasonable way to go. And so I think- That makes the first me the first be, person. Manisha. Yes, you'd be, go first. So please go ahead. Cool. Manisha Kalab. Yeah. Uh, I have a slide. Oops. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, so as a community, I think we've come a long way in the last decade. So we've gone from questioning the very nature of FRBs to uh, building uh, global collaborations uh, to study them. But we have had a head start in terms of lessons learned because uh, we've managed to uh, learn things and get applicable examples from other fields. But now that we've entered the era of almost routine localizations, we're getting um, localizations from telescopes which have excellent UV coverage, uh, like Meerkat and ASCAP, but we're also targeting repeaters um, in the case of EVN. But there's only that much you can do with a radio position. 
so we definitely need deep photometric images as well as uh, spectroscopic confirmations. And a good example of this is the host galaxy for um, R3, so 180916. Uh, but HST images showed that the FRB itself was offset from uh, a region of star formation. So to really make progress on the front of progenitors, we're going to need multi-wavelength and multi-messenger observations. And for this, we're going to need next generation telescopes, which also kind of ties into my question about uh, redshift distribution, because Amanda said we're now in the era of precision cosmology because of the unique DMZ relation, but we don't quite know how far uh, in the past, can we actually detect FRBs? Um, the other thing is we're finding repeaters and we now know they're more common than we previously thought when the first repeater was detected. And we're also identifying long-term periods. A couple of them do have long-term periods, but do all repeating FRBs have long-term periods and how are we gonna study or probe these um, activity windows as a community? I think that's another question that I had. That was it for me. Maybe Daniele wants to go next. Uh, yeah, sure. I also have a couple of slides. Um, thank oh, you. Yes. Um, okay. I hope you can hear me and see the slides yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I have uh, identified a couple of uh, questions from the talks of yesterday. And uh, the first one is, is that uh, I, um, I redshift fast radio burst are extremely useful for cosmology and fundamental physics, but uh, at the moment we only have uh, one that maybe has a redshift uh, of around three, if uh, all the at least most of the DM is from the intergalactic medium, which is of course not um, guaranteed, and only ten that may have a, a, a redshift above two. So why are, are we not detecting more of this I, uh, Z fast radio burst? Is it only a problem of luminosity? They have some luminosity uh, limit. And uh, to, uh, to show this, I've plotted uh, uh, the FRB stats website there, the fluence of detected fast radio burst as a function of the M. And it's true that there is some a cutoff there, but it's not so uh, extreme as I would have expected. Uh, the galaxy evolution may play a role, maybe not at this redshift, or uh, uh, when the chance alignment of uh, uh, foreground galaxies uh, becomes important and prevent us to detect a, a redshift fast radio burst. Um, and uh, uh, how, can in, uh, how can we find more of this? Uh, should we just uh, wait for uh, very sensitive telescopes? Uh, how many would SK found? Uh, uh, and uh, can we uh, start looking with fast? Um, and uh, a second question that uh, uh, came out a few times is if, if whether multiple uh, population of fast radio bars exist. Uh, we've seen evidences for um, uh, differences between repeaters and non-repeaters. Does this suggest two separate classes or is it still compatible with one single class? And if multiple populations exist, since there is such a spread in the properties of fast radio bars, uh, is it conceivable that there are many classes and are we ever going to be able to, to know that? And uh, if so, what strategies we could uh, pursue and um, uh, and yeah these are my my two main questions okay all right thanks Daniele and uh, Yuri Okay. Yuri, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I sure. Okay, if it is seen. Uh, well, I listed a, a few maybe problems, uh, which practically not considered uh, only touched upon until now, even though they are extremely important just for FRBs, 
taking into, into account extremely high power, power, uh, powerful radiation. First of all, there is a problem of escape of emission from the source because there are uh, various uh, nonlinear processes that uh, prevent escape. Uh, till now, uh, people uh, made estimates of uh, induced scattering, uh, which is important for um, uh, shock, shock maser model. Uh, I tried uh, to estimate other processes, and for example, in uh, magnetic sphere. Oi, sorry. Uh, the most important is uh, three wave interaction, which just produces ca cascade of waves and redistributes energy to uh, high frequency and small wavelength, and uh, eventually uh, energy decays. And according to my uh, estimates, uh, radiation with uh, typical power of strong FRB does not escape from magnetic magnetosphere. Of course, that's only estimates that it would be good to have uh, simulations because uh, such thing as uh, wave tur turbulence uh, could have some subtle point which uh, could, it is which difficult to see. But for a while, for me, uh, it is a, uh, these processes could place uh, very strong constraints on possible models. Special uh, type of processes is filamentation and modulation instabilities, which could uh, 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 split the radiation field into narrow uh, sub-beams modulated in the longitudinal, longitudinal direction. Uh, and this could uh, imprint uh, some ob uh, uh, observed structure on the radiation, uh, frequency modulation, temporal modulation, and so on. We only started to study this sort of processes, and I think uh, they are also very important. And uh, th this is independent of radiation mechanism because uh, this uh, occurs uh, at relatively large distances. So what is it in large? About uh, up to one per sec which is large distance for uh, this sort of sources. Uh, well, uh, as to bursting mechanism, again, we are still hand waving, uh, talking about magnetar bars, but we need uh, more, again, simulations uh, of, of the restructuring of a magnetic field uh, in magnetar magnetosphere. How it, uh, what magnetic disturbances it produces, how these magnetic dis disturbances propagate outwards, how shocks are formed, and uh, is it possible to form plasmoid which is which are de detached from uh, a magnetosphere, and this uh, could trigger a reconnection and so on. No, for, observationally, uh, I think uh, from uh, theoretical point of view, the most important things are constraint which could be found. Uh, from uh, observation outside of radio bands, because uh, this emission could be straightforwardly uh, interpreted. And of course, constraint on possible progenitors, uh, environments, and so on, and classifications. That's it what I would like to discuss. Okay. Well, there's quite a smorgasbord of possible discussion topics that you've, I think um, the uh, three discussion leaders have raised really interesting questions. Um, does anybody want to chime in on any of them? Don't be shy. Now's the chance. Now's the time. Well, I would say uh, we can rule out radio emission mechanisms, but I don't think we'll ever know the real mechanism because it's such a small part of the energy of the burst. Yes, this is a typical problem that, that radio emission is a dirty effect. <laughs> And therefore, it depends on uh, many details. And therefore, uh, constraints on parameters from uh, observation in uh, high energy band. High energy, I mean, 
<laughs> including optics. <laughs> uh, uh, very, uh, very important, of course. But uh, again, uh, I, I would like to stress that uh, there are many uh, theoretical constraints. And uh, taking seriously these constraints, one could uh, single out uh, the theory. Because uh, for a while, most of models ignore uh, important processes, which inevitable uh, work and uh, should be taken into account. Other comments or thoughts? Uh, I, I'd like to, to comment on the last point, the observations of the nearest fast radio burst. Um, I mean, we have searched and found nothing. What if we don't find uh, anything there? Uh, I, I think that will rule out like magnetar origin for the nearest fast radio burst. Um, what other consequence would, would this have? Uh, but at least one case, uh, we do see uh, high energy emission from, from gal uh, galactic movement. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, if uh, uh, there will be a strong uh, FRB from a strong FRB will be uh, observed from nearest galaxy. And at that time, it will be observed uh, by optical or uh, X-ray telescopes and nothing will be seen. Well, this is a big problem because according to all models, most of energy goes to high energy. We might also be just limited by current instruments. Uh, yes, sure, but uh, from maybe from nearer uh, galaxies, because uh, again, we expect uh, energy in uh, high energy, uh, high energy band, uh, five, six order of, at four, five, six order of magnitude larger than FMB. So it's not uh, so small energy. I would say that 10 to the 37 for the, the globular cluster one is not that constraining for a magnetar. You can rule out the giant flares, but not the regular stop, short burst. But that, that one's also weird. I don't know if it's a magnetar. It could be a lensed millisecond pulsar. I think for the, for the globular cluster one, it's mainly the rate that the magnetar is so short-lived and it's difficult to reach the rate whatever um, mechanism, merger mechanism you're involving, it's just difficult to have a something with active lifetime shorter than 10 to the five years. Um, so that's, 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 that's already like very different from the galactic, uh, the galactic SGR like case. Maybe that's already suggesting there are division of population. Yeah, I would like to just amplify that in that we've seen very um, different, this is a paper was just discussed in, in the Monday um, session, just that repeater uh, bursts uh, look different from non-repeater bursts. And of course there is some uh, overlap because some non-repeaters could be repeaters, but doesn't, you know, doesn't that give pause that they're really, you know, likely multiple classes or at least two different classes um, or there could be two different classes and that and the, the huge luminosity gaps you know, if 1935 yes it produces FRB like emission but but really just the bare lower limits of what you can have for FRBs there's many many orders of magnitude six to you know at least six orders of magnitude in luminosity that you still have to bridge with a magnetar and that together with the differences in repeaters and non-repeaters to me, suggests there easily could be another population uh, that's not not just magnetars. Well, I would say it could be still magnetars, just two different kinds of magnetars. <laughs> yeah, and also another 
question is like, is there any, for example, the, the energy is, is high, but, uh, but if you have some beaming, it's just scale with uh, gamma to the fourth per angular size. So you don't need to have a large variation of energy. You just need to have some variation of small variation of gamma, but that, that would require your emission region to be very small and uh, um, very coherent gamma. It, that's like a possible scenario for you to, for example, reach the case where you just have a small emission region, very coherent motion of and high, well, not, not actually need to be high, but moderate Lorentz factor. Well, it depends on, on the source. Mostly people discuss magnetar and magnetar. Uh, in pulsar, yes, because we, we have uh, natural place open to light field, which produces narrow beam. Uh, there are no good ideas in other cases how to produce something very narrow. Mm -hmm. This is, this is the problem. Of course, it could not be excluded, but, but it, and, and magnetar do not ex, uh, ex, exhibit uh, beam, strongly beam, mm -hmm. which is natural uh, for magnetar models. Therefore, it could be a puzzle. It, it, it is possible somehow to prove observationally that uh, the radiation is strongly beam. Cool, thanks. Yeah, it's just, it just sounds like it's just easier to explain the large variation of energy scale. Um, easier to explain, uh, just assuming that there is a beam, yes. But <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to reach that. But, yeah. Much harder. <laughs> and also, is there any like it, it's it's very confusing why the uh, from Ziggy's paper the repeater is uh, wider but also narrower in frequency? Is there any mechanism that would expect these two things to happen together? Do, uh, do Overall distribution of it is not very narrow. It is some very narrow st uh, uh, structure. Okay. In my view that it should be attributed. Sorry, it's my network or your network. I actually then hear it clearly. It's done. Um, about the repeater bus showing the sad trombone effect and being brought up. Don't any, I mean, none of the SGR bus actually show that, right? None of the galactic magnetar um, bus, they don't show the drifting substructure that repeater bus typically show. And we've got quite a few bursts now. So I was wondering if that somehow says something. Difficult to see. I think that's a that's a <clears throat> that is a good point. Um, that is a very different phenomenal phenomenology that you in radio emission from magnetars that um, MFRBs. That's a. Uh, it's a we're saying all repeaters exhibit all this sort of drifting substructures predictive of repetition. Then, nineteen thirty five isn't your typical repeater. That did show you know, two different components with vastly different spectra. It's not the exact, you know, marching down substructure we see in repeaters, but it's still, you know, indicative of a spectrum that's not broad because it drops off and ramps up in a 400 megahertz band, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay, well, I, I feel like um, this discussion would be really, um, I mean, it's been actually quite interesting. Uh, not a lot of time for it, unfortunately, but 
you know, if we were all in the same room, we would all go for coffee now and cookies and uh, have some really great conversations. So I, I really hope that sometime soon in the future, we will be able to do that and have all of you and uh, other good friends in the FRB community uh, together. Um, we're, we're over time and they're um, threatening to, uh, you know, cut us off. So I do want to say um, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the, uh, the efforts and they were fantastic talks. And uh, also I want to thank my uh, co-organizers Bing Zhang and Duncan Lorimer uh, for um, uh, working so nicely together on this. And thank you for everybody who came. Vicky, let uh, me thank you for uh, your session. And I am adding something. I am usually saying that GRB are making a great progress, but I think we have today good companion because I think that this fast radio burst, I'm convinced, will help in expanding the frontier of scientific knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Remo. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the session, and I, I, uh, I agree with you very strongly. Thanks. OK. OK. I'm going to shut it off now. So thank you, everybody. Goodbye. And I hope to see you in real life sometime soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.